when you watch it, it's different. That was great. You know what else is great? Finally making this show for you all. When I was preparing for this season of The Amber Ruffin Show, I watched, um, you know, I watched some Carol Burnett. I did. I watched some Dick Cavett. I watched some of those old, like, variety show variety shows. And it was very clear how little you needed. <laughs> There's just people goofing around. And I was like, oh, you know, what a relief. Like, those cool things we remember. We're just people goofing around. And that's a torch I'm willing to carry to this day. <laughs> What do I watch? I like to, when it's late, I do like to catch up. So when I'm catching up, I'm catching up on my favorite shows. And my favorite shows are Queens. I watched every last episode in real time. And I can't just be allotting time from eight to nine at night. I still have work to do. And then Abbott Elementary. Hey, yo. What it do, baby boobs? What y'all think about this little film crew I brought in here? Distracting, makes our jobs harder. But exciting. We about to be on TV. Because they are covering underfunded, poorly managed public schools in America. No press is bad press, Barb. Look at Mel Gibson. Still thriving. <laughs> Abbott Elementary is great. It is just very character driven. But I do think that Abbott Elementary found some very fun characters and leaned into them. And even though they're big characters, you haven't seen them before. You know, they found a new take on, you know, the bully and a new take on the nerd. Like, it's all so fresh. It's great. And Quinta is the best. What I watch when I need comfort food is the same thing everyone watches when they need comfort food. And that's Ted Lasso. It's the most comforting show on planet Earth. It's just as good as everybody says, but... The people who love Ted Lasso might not know that they also love Joe Para's show, Joe Para Talks With You. It is this very gentle comedian, and he just is living in, I think, Wisconsin, and, you know, being his gentle self, and, you know, whittling wood and stuff. And along those same lines, John Wilson, How To With John Wilson, is also a very comforting show where... You know, not a lot happens, but it stays interesting, and then afterwards you feel a little happier. Those are the three shows. What I watch that might surprise people is, it shouldn't, but it always does, is Grey's Anatomy. Man, I've been watching Grey's Anatomy since the very beginning. It probably started, I don't know, at this point, 12, 18 years ago. It's a million years old. What I watch that reminds me of my childhood. I don't have an answer to this question, but what I don't watch that reminds me of my childhood is Pen15. Pen15 is that show about those two very nerdy nerds going through high school or junior high, but it was so exactly what it was like to be made fun of in school that it was, and I was made fun of like no one's business, that it, I just couldn't watch it. There were these boys in our grade who were not kind to Look, I need you to beat them up, yeah. Gigi. Like, it just needs to happen. Why should I? See, like I told you, he wouldn't care. This is literally like the worst day of my life and he'll probably call me you just too. I, I tried, <laughs> I tried, and it was hilarious, but it just felt, it, it was too soon. <laughs> it's too soon. It's too terrible. Too accurate a depiction. Could not watch it. Never will. Great show. I'll never see it. What I watch that I'm obsessed with right now. The Eyes of Tammy Faye. That was so good. I mean, also, I remember each one of those moments. But it was great. And then I kept forgetting that it was Jessica Chastain. She did such a good job. And Andrew Garfield. I was like, how... Are they doing this? It was a great movie. The Eyes of Tammy Faye. When I want to laugh, I guess I watch Saturday Night Live. A huge Saturday Night Live guy. Times a million, I love it. I've always loved it. And I'm not one of those freaking turds who's like, it used to be any of that. SNL is good today. It was good yesterday. It was good when I was eight. It'll be good in eight more years. It'll always be good. SNL is always good. Oh, I love Amber. So interesting, too, to hear about the late night shows that Amber loved before landing her own. All right, thanks to uh, Amber for swinging by and hanging with us. We appreciate it. Coming up next, 
Judy Greer opens up about her dog, Mary, and how Mary's changed her life. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. Yes, I love it. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. Yes, I love it. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Allie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. In our My Pet Tale series, we ask folks, of course, about their pets and how the pets that they've had have shaped their lives. Well, Judy Greer has a beloved dog named Mary, and we even learn just how much Mary helps Judy when she feels homesick. A uh, little furry creature. Her name is Mary Richards, named after the title Mary Tyler Moore's character from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. I'm too young to remember it being on television, but um, I watched it. I guess I saw it, you know, probably on like TV Land or one of the cable channels in some hotel room when I was on location working and feeling homesick, and it made me so happy. I ordered all seasons on DVD, and I used to travel with them so that I could watch them on my laptop when I was traveling for work because it was so comforting to me. I also really responded to the Mary Richards character because it was pretty groundbreaking when you think about it. I mean, this was a woman who broke up with her fiance, moved to the big city, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in order to pursue a career in broadcasting, which again, at the time was very unheard of. Well, I had the most uh, incredible male dog. His name was Buckley and I had him for years and he was my love and my roommate and my best friend. And you know, like all animals, unfortunately, he had to go live on the forever farm with his mom and about a year went by after Buckley left us and my vet Dr. Werber who I loved um, called me one day and was like hey I think it's time and I was like it's not time and he said just I work with a rescue they need a foster over Thanksgiving for this little dog would you just foster her and so that's when I picked up Mary and um, she basically curled up in a ball and just like I carried her around in a tote bag for two weeks and then it was the day before the adoption where I was supposed to take her and then all the people come and like I just lost my mind and I I called my husband and I'm like I can't, I can't get rid of her and he's like oh my gosh I'm about to shoot a live show fine we can keep her like please don't bother me at work anymore so my timing was really good but there was really something so special about having this little creature with me um, that did like, I think, lower my blood pressure a lot. And I, I can't think of an um, exact moment in time when I knew she was staying with us, but it just felt like, oh, this is a good thing for me. I feel like I shouldn't have to tell people why it's so important to <laughs> adopt instead of shop. I mean, there's just so many animals that need homes. And there's even now so many like breed specific rescues that if you're like, well, I have to have this kind of breed of dog or I need, you know, hypoallergenic or whatever, like you can find that. There's just so many animals that like are needlessly euthanized. I mean, every day that could easily be adopted into homes. And I think that, you know, Fostering is such a great way to see how a pet's gonna work in your family. I mean, you can 
find such great animals and they're so happy to have a home and to not have to live in those cages. And Mary's like this tiny little cute, like teddy bear sort of fox raccoon looking dog, but she's really scary if she wants to be. So that took some getting used to and a lot of training. And she has chilled out a lot. She's really feeling self-confident. She's really feeling herself these days. Um, I started traveling with her when I go on location to shoot things and I brought her with me to New Orleans to shoot the thing about Pam and she went over everyone on set and in fact Renee Zellweger's character Pam Hupp has a dog and I can't tell you how many of my friends texted me after that first episode aired and they were like is Mary in the thing about Pam? Like, no, there is only room for one actress in this family. Um, but Mary was there and she was like running around and she was such a cutie. Sometimes when she's like a little judgmental and mean, I like to think that she's like my alter ego. My favorite thing with Mary, I love, I love going on really long walks and Mary really loves to go on long walks. We've walked seven miles in one day together. I mean, she'll just walk and walk and walk. I think she would walk until she would drop. The thing about Mary that's funny, like the thing about Pam, I just realized I said that. But the thing about Mary that's funny is that she plays really hard to get, but she's so tiny and cute that people keep like, they just keep wanting more of her. They keep wanting her. If she lets, if she lets you pet her once, then you just like want to keep petting her. But like the next day she might be like, I don't really like, I'm not like feeling you today. She really does march to the beat of her under her and she's, uh, she's not someone that can be pinned down, you know, like she might like you one day, but then she might not like you ever again. Every day is a new day with Mary. That's what I always tell people. Mary has made my life better in every single way. I used to get so homesick when I was on location. And now like when I have her with me, it's so much better. She's, she gives me a reason to get up in the morning and like on a day off. And sometimes I'm like, mm, I miss my husband and I'm homesick. She like, I think genuinely brings a lot of joy to work. Like she runs all around hair and makeup when we're in the trailer and she loves it and everyone brings treats and gives them to her. And she just, animals bring a lot of joy and they definitely like calm people down, I think. And so, um, yeah, she's just made my life better in every single way. Um, minus the dog hair that but she's little it's not that bad but i do usually have a lint roller with me thanks to judy for sharing her great pet love coming up next melissa joan hart reminisces over sabrina the teenage witch these days it feels like the news never stops so let's get into it what's happening right now what it all means for you for an hour every day it can be hard to keep up so let's get started together Hallie jackson now weekdays at five on nbc news now to stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts we are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes i think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons join hoda for new episodes of her podcast making space listen now Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking good. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good! I love it! NBC News, streaming free now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. And welcome back. Melissa Joan Hart was only 20 years old when she landed the role of Sabrina in the Sabrina the Teenage Witch show. And she sat down with us for our flashback series and shared what it was like to work on the 90s sitcom.
I guess I would um, describe Sabrina as sort of quintessential teen girl, doesn't want to draw too much attention to herself, but happens to wake up one morning with magical powers and has to deal. Wait. Don't come in here again. From now on, you use the freak's bathroom. I was 20 when I started it and I actually created it. Um, it was an Archie comic and my mom found the Archie comic book on a playground and she sold it to Viacom as a TV movie. And then my mom kept saying to Viacom, this would be a great series. And they were like, okay, uh, we'll see. And she kept saying, no, 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 it'll be a great series. I'm like, all right. And she was like, this would be a great series. And they cut it together. She cut it together into a uh, trailer and gave it to the network and they were like, oh, this is a great idea for a series. She's like, yes, I know. So the series came together that way. So I never had to audition. It was my part created for me by my mother. The best part about playing her, so any actor, you know, we like to be actors because we like to kind of slip into lots of different skins and pretend to be lots of different people. And so having a series on the air for seven years for a lot of actors can be kind of tiresome because you play the same character for so long, you, you, you want to stretch out a little more, you want to do a little more. But with Sabrina, it was great because I got to be everybody plus Sabrina. I got to be Cyrano. I got to be a trapeze artist. I got to be Cinderella. I got to be Rapunzel. I loved when she would take on some kind of personality or some other, um, you know, wardrobe or I was a snowman. I, I skied on Mars or, you know, so stuff like that. So that made it really exciting and different. And the actor in me loved that part. We'll see how they like it when they don't have somebody to enforce the law. I swear, the first person I run into... And Zelda? Congratulations. You're the new sheriff. With Sabrina, I was definitely acting because I was definitely playing um, against my type. I was never the wallflower. I was always the one doing a dance performance in the middle of the room or, you know, and here's Sabrina who just wants to be like left alone and quiet and don't let anyone see me. And I'm, you know, I'm going to hide over here. And I just, I didn't quite understand that. So for me, it wasn't the most fun, like the things we were talking about before, like the playing the other roles or getting dressed up in fun costumes. That was all really exciting for me, but the actual character herself, I didn't necessarily identify with. Sabrina, you usually have good ideas. What sort of a fundraiser would you suggest? Pancakes! <laughs> My favorite episode when we were filming it, and still to this day, I think, is probably the pancake episode. I think because it was probably my first time doing physical comedy, and I really loved it. I was like diving in trash cans and, tra and just playing like an addict like that, like just being like, I need a pancake, I need a pancake. And like, it was something I could really, for lack of, for, you know, here's a nice pun, but bite my teeth into. Like I could sink my teeth into like that character and the fun that I was having playing like a strung out teenager in a kid's sitcom, you know, it was like, it was really fun to play. Like, I know a lot of people get excited that Britney was on the show or Sync or Backstreet Boys, but I was always thrilled and I requested, as the executive producer, I could do that. Um, people like the Violent Femmes, Blondie, um, Johnny Mathis for a Christmas episode, you know? I mean, who doesn't want to be with Johnny Mathis when he's singing White Christmas? Lonnie Anderson we had the best time with, or Raquel Welch I had such a great time with. And, you know, all the men on set, of course, were like, oh my God, it's Raquel Welch, you know? And I'm like, I'm getting to act with her for a week. And it was really fun. Getting to go from everything, from pop stars to hardcore rock bands to athletes. Uh, Brady Anderson, I had a massive crush on. He was on the show. Um, some of the guys from like uh, Baywatch and, you know, like all these like hot, amazing actors and actresses. And it, it was just such fun because everybody wanted to come play with us. Everybody wanted to be on a magical show. Everybody's kids watched the show and wanted them on it or something. We had a great chemistry. Everyone was there for the right reasons. Everyone was there knowing that this was a great opportunity. Nobody took it for granted. Everyone rode that roller coaster as long as they could, you know, like knowing this is a, we're on a network show in the heyday of television, you know, not only making good money, but getting a lot of attention for our work. And that's what every actor dreams of, you know? And so we got to be in everybody's house every Friday night and people all across the world felt like they knew us. It's been decades of hearing, you know, I grew up with you. I heard Daniel Radcliffe say it, and I've heard like all these people say, I grew up with you. And you're like, what? Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the best compliment because it just means that they allowed me in their home and I was there with them. A lot of people, I was there for the hard times. I was there when they were in the hospital. I was there when they were going through depression and felt alone. I was there when they couldn't, you know, I mean, not just me, the whole show, you know, and a lot of the show, a lot of people identify with Sabrina 
uh, because of bullying or because of um, feeling like an outsider. You know, they might not have magical powers, but they feel like an outsider. And so I think that the show gave so many people hope somewhere to turn to where they didn't feel alone and lonely. And I think that that was, that was like everything, you know? Thanks to Melissa for chatting with us. Last but not least, up next, Gilmore Girls star Kelly Bishop and her love for Emily Gilmore's combative attitude. NBC News, streaming free now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. All right, we're back. Kelly Bishop might be best known for her role on Gilmore Girls as Rory's harsh grandma, Emily, and she was kind enough to reflect on her time on the show with us. How would I describe Emily Gilmore? I used to say Emily Gilmore is a piece of work. She's um, no nonsense. Uh, she's smart. She's uh, conservative. She has values that are very kind of straight-laced. Uh, she's not foolish. She's uh, she's up with current things, but there's a certain uh, value system that she expects people to live by, particularly her daughter. What was my favorite part about Emily? Well, I like the clothes. Uh, they spent a lot of money on my wardrobe. I liked her attitude. I mean, she was so difficult and demanding and uh, hard to please as far as Lorelai was concerned. Uh, and what I really loved about that whole show was Amy Sherman Palladino's writing, because it's some of the best material I've, it's probably the best material I've ever done. And, uh, oh God, amazing. Funny, smart, on top of it, and as everybody knows, really fast. So uh, that was just one of the many favorite things. I love doing this show. Lauren and I, uh, the day we met, it was like, okay, I could do this. And she and I became so close and still are close. She really is like a daughter to me and I really am kind of like a mother to her. We don't spend a lot of time, you know, talking to each other or texting or anything like that. But whenever we get together, it just clicks right in again. There's just a real love and trust and, and pleasure. You know, we, we have the same sense of humor. Uh, yeah, she's, she's great. I'm, I'm really crazy about Lauren. My all-time favorite episode, actually the one that tickles me the most because it was so different, there was one uh, where uh, Richard, my husband's uh, mother, who was a very difficult woman, uh, had passed away. And uh, I found, if I recall correctly, I found a letter that she had written to him the night before our wedding, I think, begging him not to marry me. I know that the timing of this is particularly awkward since you are to be married tomorrow. No way! But your happiness is too important to me, so timing be damned. She wanted Dad to leave you at the altar. She begged him to leave me at the altar. She begged him in writing, and then she saved the carbon. And uh, that sort of sent me off. He wasn't there to support me because he was so grieving for his mother. 
that during that episode I was drinking. There was even one scene where I was smoking a cigarette. I said I called it my the Tennessee Williams episode for me. <sighs> Who was that at the door? It was Jason. Dad needs to sign something. Uh huh. I mean, she was just out there. She was so un Emily. Uh, that was great fun. I really had fun doing that one. There were a few episodes that I really liked, but that one was just such a departure. The zingers and the put downs. Oh boy. Uh, actually, one of my first ones, one of the reasons I love the pilot script so much, I, I couldn't believe this pilot script when I got it. It was so funny. And I had no idea who any of these people were or, or who the writer was, anything like that. It's when uh, Lorelai comes to see her parents in the pilot script, obviously to ask for money for Rory's education. And uh, I open the door and I said something to the effect of, is it Christmas? Hi, Mom. Lorelai. My goodness, this is a surprise. Is it Easter already? <laughs> or is it Easter? It was some holiday, which was indicative of perfect writing, of saying that's how often they saw each other. It was on, on holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever it was. And then uh, Richard, my husband's character, comes in sometime later after we've done this scene, and he basically does the same thing with a different holiday. Hi, Dad. What is it? Christmas already? Lorelai was taking a business class at the college today and decided to drop in to see us. Favorite moments with Ed Herman. I just loved working with him. We really liked each other so much. I know, I know one of my favorite uh, scenes with him was when we did renew our vows and he, we danced to the song Bill and he said today, I mean, that was your favorite, you know, your favorite song and today you can call me Bill. Emily would tease me saying, if only your name was Bill, then this could be our song. Well, Emily, for tonight, and tonight only, my name is Bill, and this is our song. That was wonderful, you know. Uh, he was such a good actor, and very generous, very professional, but just a sweet, good man. Why is it still cooking? First of all, it's very intelligent. I mean, if you the smarter you are, the more you get it. And it's fast, and so you gotta pay attention. You don't have much time to laugh because you gotta catch up with what's going on. Um, it's funny. I mean, it's, it really is a funny show. But what I decided was that there's really an innate sweetness about it, which sounds kind of icky, but it's not that. There's a, there's a decency about it. Um, and one of the things that men started, when men started watching it, which they weren't inclined to because it was Gilmore Girls and all that sort of thing, uh, is that if you look at the male characters in that show, there's no nasty guy, there's no jerk, there's no misogynist, uh, there's no violence. They're just trying to make their way in the world like all the rest of us. And so there's, uh, what there is basically is an innate decency about these people. They're good people. There's, some of them are very strange, but they're, they're good. And I heard a wonderful uh, story last year sometime, that very often um, when the troops come back from maneuvers in places like Afghanistan and places that we you know, hear too much about, they very often sit down and watch Gilmore Girls. And I think it's because it's a feel-good place. It's like this is what America is supposed to be. Great to revisit memories like that. All right, that's going to do it. Thanks for tuning in to Popstar today. As always, we're so glad you joined us. Come back tomorrow and hang out with us again. Same time, same place. See you then. If you think you know Kim Kardashian from that reality show, Keeping Up With The Kardashians, I'm just here to say you don't know nothing yet about Kim. Kim Kardashian She's a brand, a multi-billion dollar brand with nearly 300 million followers on social media. She is the co-founder of a perfume collection, a makeup line, and so much more. But the biggest seller for Kim Kardashian is herself. People cannot get enough of this woman, of her family, her lifestyle, her choices. And while, yes, she is in the midst of a hectic work schedule, and she's also in the middle of a divorce from Kanye West, the father of her four kids, She's calmer than she seemed in a decade. She is in a new relationship with comedian and Saturday Night Live cast member Pete Davidson. She just launched another campaign for her shapewear line, Skims, 
And her famous family, well, they're about to embark on a new chapter of the reality show, The Kardashians. This time it's on Hulu. So what is Kim Kardashian making space for these days? Well, law school aside, she is making space for herself. Kim, it's so great to see you. I'm so happy that you have time to sit with me today. I've got a, a podcast called Making Space, and I weirdly feel like you're in a moment in your life where everything everything is slowing down. Everything seems more peaceful and simpler. And I'm not sure if I'm reading into it, but I'm getting this total vibe about your life today that there's a more of a calm, uh, a more calm going on. Am I right? There definitely is a lot of calm. I'd say when you have four kids, they'll never really fully be calm, like ever. And I think when people say, oh, you're so much calmer now, or you seem like at peace now, I was definitely at peace and, and loving not being calm before. I don't think that there's like, the two are pit against each other or that, one is better than the other. I think at the phase in my life that I was at for the last decade, I've loved and it made me who I am today and I've grown and evolved, but it was super spontaneous and so much going on and so amazing. Um, I think I just like prefer now to, I work you know, really hard and long hours and in school and um, I think that what I choose to do with my off time now is just probably a little bit more simpler things. And so I feel more of a sense of inner calmness, but it doesn't, but my life definitely isn't calm. I think people around me would be like, do you ever take a minute, you know? Um, so yes, there, there is a calmness for sure, but I loved every phase that I've been in in my life. Not too long ago, I ended a eight year relationship and it was not simple. Did you know for a long time that it wasn't the right fit? Were you just continuing or was it something that kind of came on? No, I think that, you know, in life, it's especially, you know, I've been divorced before and it's extremely difficult. I would say getting a divorce with children is a whole other level of pain and hard times that I just didn't even know existed. Um, but I really wanted to make a decision and it wasn't a quick decision. It wasn't, you know, it was something I think just over time spending a lot of time apart and realizing, especially during the whole like quarantine time and having to spend a lot of time together after spending so much time apart, you just realize what really makes you happy. And, um, you know, I think some people might try to think maybe it's a selfish, selfish decision because I do have four kids and I do want to be mindful of everyone's feelings involved. But I think like for once I was like, I want to really choose my happiness over anything and my peace of mind. And I think I like something just stuck out to me. Uh, my mom used to always like cry to me when I was in these, you know, bad relationships and, you know, college and years ago. And she used to say, all I want for my kids and all I want for you is peace of mind. And when I like woke up and realized that I didn't have that, that's all I was looking for. And so I think that no matter what, it doesn't mean that, you know, everyone didn't try and it doesn't mean that I don't wish that it, you know, had turned out differently and, and there's nothing more than you'd want for everyone to be happy. But I think it also showed a lot of personal strength for me because I was really a people pleaser and I wanted everyone else to be happy that I finally was like, why am I measuring and trying to make other people happy over myself? And that takes a lot of strength to do, even if you know that it'll make your kids upset as well for a time period. I think, you know, one day they're gonna grow up and be out of the house and it's just gonna be me and I'm gonna have to sit there with my happiness. And, um, I saw, you know, my mom stay in a relationship too long when she wasn't as happy. And, and I just never wanted to, once I knew for sure in my heart and soul, I just wanted, I realized everyone's going to heal quicker 
if I just make the move instead of not being my authentic self and not finding my inner peace. Well, there's a great Alicia Keys song I just heard with Brandi Carlisle, and it's called I Have a Voice. And it gives me chills when I hear it because when you're a pleaser, a people pleaser, your voice gets squished down. Sometimes it's so silent you can't even hear it. You don't even whisper to yourself anymore. You're just like, you know what? I'm just going to plod along and go along my merry way. But um, do you kind of believe that when you are peaceful, your kids will be too? Like it's almost like they feel your Absolutely. total vibe. Absolutely. I think when you're happy, your kids are happy. And even if it's hard and they don't understand at the time, I mean, I went through it and I understood it eventually with my parents. And I just think there's also, that's as a part of life. And these are also growing lessons and learning lessons for my kids too. And so I think that they will ultimately be better people when they're faced with hard times and faced with real life situations. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world, because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything that's you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. I that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. How do you trust, this is something for everybody who's been in a relationship that didn't work, and then you see something that might work, but then you think, I'm not sure, I don't know. You get gun shy, you get afraid, I don't wanna, you know, you just get afraid, but it seems to me that you followed some instinct in you, your soul or your spirit or something, that said, yes, this is something to try with Pete. Yeah, I think that, you know, Sometimes things happen when you just least expect it. Yeah. It was like the last thing that I was really planning on. Um, and so when it did happen, we were kind of like, oh my God, I wasn't like planning on this and this isn't even what I was thinking of. And like, it just makes it that much sweeter and so much more fun when you just, Sometimes you just can't plan everything out and you can't, you have to be open to it and you have to like, you know, I definitely took my time. I took like, you know, 10 months or something before I dated or talked to anyone and I just wanted that time to really figure out and go through the motions. Am I making the right decision? How do I feel about this? Like you'll never know until you're put in situations. Um, and so once I went through all of the motions, I finally was like, okay, guys, I am so ready to meet someone. And I randomly did. And I think you just, like Chloe asked me this question once. She was like, how do you know to trust a person? Yeah. Like, how do you know to trust? And I was like, I've never thought about that. I've always been really trusting and I've never really had a guard up, but sometimes you just know. And sometimes you just like know when to trust. And so I just, I kind of go with it. And I feel like everything has happened that could possibly happen that is heartbreaking, you know, in all of our lives. I've seen it with my sisters and my mom. And just like, we all know someone that's been through a really hard time in relationships and everyone's been okay. And everyone comes out okay. So you just have to like let yourself go and open yourself up to receive something and just be a good person and you'll get that back. And no matter what, everyone's gonna be okay. 
that's kind of like my outlook on everything with life. It is. It is. Do you trust yourself again to get married again? I want to live in the moment. I definitely want to, you know, I do love a relationship. That's the kind of like girl that I am. I don't really want to be, you know, dating around and stuff like that, but I do live in the moment and I do think that I am holding you know, a little bit more close to my heart on certain aspects of my relationship with Pete. And it feels good just to know that, like, we have this connection and we have our little bubble of a relationship world that we live in that, like, not a lot of people know about. Mm. I, I think it's cool, even the little things we do know. You go, you go out for pizza. You're like, oh, Everything's just cool and regular and not so not such a big deal. We were deal. driving in the car yesterday and I just like looked at him and I was like, "Thank you." And he's like, "What?" And I was like, "For running errands with me." Like, this is so much fun just to like go to a doctor's appointment or go to the dentist and just like run errands. Like I'm having so much fun. <laughs> It's so, it's like back to the beginning, back to before everything, yeah. right? I mean, and, and again, like it's not to say that any amazing big experience I had was mm -hmm. not so much fun as well and so worth it. It's just like where I'm at in life, I I feel like we worked so hard and we just want to enjoy, you know, different things. Like, and, and I'm just so content. That's a beautiful word, by the way. Okay, if you had a day that was just for you, Kim, you woke up, your kids were all being taken care of, Pete was busy. Where's this day? You open your eyes, it's a beautiful sunrise. You have one day for Kim, just for Kim. How would you, and no work, how would you fill that day? Oh my gosh, I would, I would work out because I love to work out. Um, yes. I would yeah. hopefully be waking up on the beach somewhere really beautiful mm. um, and just lay in bed all day and watch TV and movies and eat in bed. <laughs> I'm like such a homebody. I love to stay home. I love that you eat in bed. Uh, okay, some people are totally nope. against that. I have that. a dust buster by my bed, in my, in my <laughs> side table drawer. I hate crumbs in the bed. So I definitely will put down a, a, a towel. I have trays, I have the most comfortable trays and I just eat on the trays, and my dustbuster is always on deck. Okay, snack of choice in oh bed. Oh my God, well, I'm eating extremely clean. Now, I love to just eat my dinners and stuff, oh. but I mean, my favorite snacks okay, ever, yeah. like Cheetos and mm -hmm. cookies yeah. and stuff Triscuits like and like so many random little things. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good! I love it! Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good! I love it! Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. 
Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Do you feel, I feel like your life is full. Are there things that you feel like you are missing? Any puzzle pieces that aren't quite there yet? If you say, if I just, I'm just working toward that. I feel like you have so many irons in the fire that it's hard to quantify, but is there is there something that you feel like needs to snap into place? Yeah, I really gotta like get it together with law school. It's really hard. Yeah. I gotta like, I gotta finish. I have like, you know, almost two years left. Mm -hmm. And um, I have th I study three hours a day every day, and it is really hard. And I just can't wait. I keep on saying like, okay, I can't even entertain this business thing or this that I can't put another thing on my plate until school is done. I need to finish school, and once that happens, I will be a different human being. Do you kind of feel that sometimes you're underestimated when you walk into a room, Kim? Absolutely. And I've always been the underdog. Always. And that's okay with me. Like I'm, if anything, I like for someone to really be un like unpleasantly surprised and mm -hmm. maybe expect less and be blown away when maybe I give them more than they thought that I would ever give them, you know, but that's always mm -hmm. just been what people have perceived. And I don't know if that's mm -hmm. why I've worked so hard to try to figure it out and to try to show people. I mean, you know, your life changes and what you care about mm -hmm. can all change and grow and evolve. And so I really don't mind being the underdog and being thought differently and proving myself because I think that's what always has like kept that fire under me. Mm -hmm. Even if I didn't understand it at the time or couldn't understand certain people's decisions, I, um, I like applaud people's growth and where they're at. And um, yeah, I really just don't mind being that person and that underdog. I mean, people. can you just line out, just give me one snapshot of a day because I don't think I, I know you and I know how hard you work. There's not a harder a person who works harder. Line out your day for me. You wake up and go. I wake up at 5.40, I go to the gym from 6 to 7, 7.05, get the kids up, get them all ready for school, all four of them, help brush their teeth, get their uniforms on, eat breakfast, get them out the door, drive them to school, come back, start glam um, or study. Mm -hmm. It's like I have that few hour study mm -hmm. time or glam and or it's vice mm -hmm. versa. Then I film, and then I either go to a Skims campaign or a Skims fabric meeting, and then um, I'm, you know, relaunching my beauty brand soon. So it's like formulas and products and packaging and you know meetings all day, and then um, pick the kids up from school. Or if I'm in the middle of a shoot or something and I can't, I meet them after school. Always have dinner mm -hmm. with the kids, and then at nighttime either do my reading for studying for school. Or um, just do all my like skims content and organize. I'm big on organizing and making sure everything's in place. And then I go to bed around. I put all the kids to bed, and then I'm finally to bed around 10:30 myself. Oh my and then the day That's starts day. all That's over again. That's a day. Kim started the shapewear brand Skims in 2019, filling a gap in the market with underwear, shapewear, and loungewear for people of all shapes and sizes and skin tones. Today, the company is worth billions. Did you ever imagine that Skims would be a $3.2 billion company? I did I mean, not. I had hopes, obviously. I had such high hopes because I just felt like anytime there's something missing in the marketplace that you're always trying to find a solution for, other people are trying to find that same solution. Mm -hmm. So when I realized that, you know, in shapewear, there just was not size inclusivity and color tone inclusivity. I just knew that even just like where the seams were and everything that I was mm -hmm. changing on shapewear myself and wanting to perfect, I found that creating my own line was just going to be my best bet. And I love every minute of it. I mean, I come up with mm -hmm. every campaign, every style, every fabric. I'm at every campaign. Like, it's just... Even doing the one with the the my favorite icons, you know, I wasn't supposed to be mm -hmm. in that campaign. I just went to go see how they were doing and bring a beignet truck for them as a little <laughs> treat. And they were like, oh, no, no, you're getting in this campaign. You're getting in. And I was like, oh, my God, what? I, I wasn't prepared, and I didn't get a spray tan, and I didn't, you know, and they were like, who cares? Get in it. 
You're in. And you did. And I did. And it was so much fun. And I'll have that memory forever. But I just have so many fun ideas that it's like my baby. You know, anytime I work on something now, it has to be like, I'm so obsessed. It's my baby. I can't, you know, wait to just show people what we have coming. And it's so much fun. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Look who's back together. Oh, I'm so, so happy. And me. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Well, keeping up with the Kardashians, we all saw, we watched as you bid that farewell. And sometimes when something's done, it's done. You just lock the box and say, that was a good ride. See you later, alligator. But something happened. This thing got another life. Uh, it's on Hulu. So what was it that made you decide, maybe we're not done yet? Um, in all honesty, a bidding war yeah. from streaming services came in and we just were like, okay, how can we, we worked so hard for so many years and like it was, you know, so it's the best lesson, but then it was just a really good opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And we thought, you know what, let's take a year off. Let's not film for a year and let's let life happen. And we did. Mm -hmm. And then we all knew that we were going to miss it. Like we just were like, it yeah. was a bittersweet thing where we just felt like our time on the network was up and our time just together like that was up. And then just coming together again was so much fun. The first day of filming was so weird. We were just, Why? we couldn't believe that we were filming again and, and just like the way that we film is a little bit different. I think the viewer would love to just see or hopefully they'll love it just how documentary style it is and just how individual mm. it is and you see mm -hmm. each sister and family member really on their own and kind of separate and then we kind of all come together where the last show was like all together all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think just knowing that it was going to be a little bit different and that's such a scary thing like to start over and to, you know, because keeping up was so iconic. We're so close mm -hmm. to the producers, you know. We loved everyone and it was like, how do we start over? Is Are we making such a big mistake? Should we have just left it there? But I think after seeing the edits and, and seeing how it's shot and we're so excited and I'm just so excited for the viewer to see it. Well, I have to talk about just you and your sisters for one second because I remember it was years ago but Kathy Lee and I went because Kendall was in a fashion show uh, she was walking the catwalk and when we got there all of you guys were there there were no cameras there was nothing you guys were screaming like it was the first time you'd seen Kendall on the catwalk oh I know and I said in that minute that's why the show's successful because they love each other camera lights on camera lights off they're supporting and they're screaming to her like like they had never seen her do it before and I was cracking up and Kathy Lee's like that's how they are of course but that's the magic isn't it like that's the thing that makes Kathy people lean in. Kathy used to say that all the time she used to say yeah. like you guys when we were kids like like super yeah. young she would be like I, I was a teenager and she would she would say like you guys are insane like what where's the camera like <laughs> Reality TV was just starting out, and she was like, you guys just have to have your own show. This is insane. Yeah, um, she said it, yeah. But I think that we're the same, you know, <laughs> cameras on, like you said, cameras off. I mean, there's not mm -hmm. one of my friends from high school that can say I'm any different now than I was 
back in high school. Mm -hmm. And I think we've just always maintained that. And I feel so lucky that we've had each other as a family to come up together. I mean, to think about it, we mm -hmm. all got our first check together. We all bought our first car together. We all bought, you know, got our first place. Like we had each other. We all ran into mm -hmm. our first celebrity that we were freaking out over. Like we had every same experience yeah. together as a family. So it's like just different than one of us moving out here from, you know, a different state and calling the other sister saying, oh my God, guess who I just met? Or, oh my God, guess what I just got? Like, we just, we kind of were able to share every experience together, which I think is pretty cool mm -hmm. and has kept us super grounded. But yeah, we support each other no matter what. We fight just like every family. I mean, I think that when we started filming, we couldn't have even imagined half the stuff that was gonna happen and go on uh -huh. in our lives yeah. filming. I mean, we thought, how are we gonna get to a season two? We have nothing to film mm -hmm. about, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just feel lucky that we're starting a new journey. Um, on Hulu and, and I hope that the fans like it just as much as they liked keeping up. I feel like we're rushing 100 miles an hour and I feel like, you know, they talk about how the, the top layer of the ocean is very, very tumultuous, but if you go down deep, it's calm and it's peaceful. And up on the top layer, they say it's like it's the things you gotta do. I gotta, I gotta pick up the kids, I gotta go to work, I gotta get to the meeting, I gotta check on the skims. But if you go deeper, it's calm and peaceful. What, what do you hope to make space for in this coming year in your life? I just hope to make as much space for my kids, to be honest. Mm. I try to spend as, so much time with them. I actually hope to make space for myself too, just to have, mm. you know, a little vacay without the kids maybe, or, yeah. you know, just, I think that's super important is to always make space for yourself, but, but to make mm -hmm. space for your kids when they really need you and, just make sure that you're there to do homework and all the little things add up to, to the big things. So I just, mm -hmm. um, I do make space for that and I just wanna continue to do that. Yeah, my favorite parenting hack when I'm asking my kids something is, the only thing I say to them is, tell me more. That's it, my only line to them and then all of a sudden out comes the entire day. Yeah. When I start That's asking them specifics, that they don't, they don't, they're like, I don't know, nothing. Tell me more, and they go, let me think of some. Oh, guess what happened, Mom? And they tell me some beautiful story. Yeah, oh, I love that. I'm gonna use that, yeah. I'm gonna steal that from you. It's a good one. Kim, I love you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Oh my gosh, love you. Thank you for having right. me. You got it, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Pastry. What are you doing? <laughs> um, can we not put your face in the dough? I'm glad it's just us eating it. Hi everybody and welcome to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. I can't wait to take a look back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal segments and offer just a few of those tips and tricks that didn't quite make it into the original episode. In today's episode, we are all about apples. Everyone in my family loves apples and I use them in so many different recipes in so many different ways. Just ask Ollie. <laughs> 
I love taking the boys apple picking. I don't know why it ends up being one of the most stressful days. Um, you know, somebody has to go to the bathroom, somebody's hungry, uh, there's no parking because the <laughs> apple orchards are so crowded outside of New York City, but I am determined to always take the boys apple picking. I just think it's fun once you kind of go along that row and there's nobody else around for a little while and you pick the best apples, you kind of sneak a bite here and there. And the best part is I make so many different things with apples that I love bringing a big bushel of apples home and just seeing what we can do with them. For anyone else who went apple picking recently, here are two easy ways to use up all those apples. First up, my crunchy apple salad. Cal has a list of the ingredients you'll need for this recipe. So let's go through the ingredients, okay? What's in our apple salad? Apple. And zucchini. <laughs> Try again, not zucchini. Salad? So close. Celery. Celery. <laughs> and what are these? I think you know. Cranberry. You've been snacking on those since we started. You know what this is? A nut. It's a walnut. Walnut. And then you know this one. Yogurt. Lots of vanilla yogurt. So this apple salad is a perfect after school snack. It's a good breakfast. It's just a good all around nice healthy alternative. How's the yogurt doing? Do you want a spoon? Gross. Now help me with the apple. Let me, let me cut it up into a smaller piece for you. You are actually eating all of my ingredients. No, not that many. Chop it up nice and small. You're doing a lot more eating than cooking. What's your favorite fruit? Apple. <laughs> I'm throwing it and it's really hard. While you do that, I'm going to chop up the celery. Okay. I like to make the celery really small. Why? So that it's not too hard to chew. Hmm. So, Kevin, when I was little, yeah. I used to eat this all the time, every single morning for breakfast. Was that a long time ago? It was a long time ago. Even when I first moved to New York, I used to eat it all the time, every morning for breakfast. Yeah, eat that here. Mix it up. Yeah, mix it all together. All right, what should we put in next? How about some of these? Yeah, sure. Sprinkle those all in there. I can pour it. Okay. Perfect. And now let's chop these up a little smaller. Just rock your knife back and forth. <laughs> Look at how small I made these. Whoa. So now we got all our ingredients in here, right? And here's the fun part. There you go. And this is the medium one or the biggest one? What, bowl or a spoon? Spoon. That's the small one. I have to lick it off. Did you have to lick it off? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, because there's yogurt on it. <laughs> so you can add as much yogurt as you want. It's not really a measurement here. It's more just once everything is all nice and combined. Sometimes I'll add blueberries in here. Oh, I have to lick it off. Oh. I just eat it off. So that's it. Super simple, right? I usually make a big bowl of this and then just scoop it out in the morning or you can divvy it up into little Tupperware containers and it's good to go as a grab and go snack. Are we done? That's it. That's all we have to do. Are you going to taste one? I'm going to taste one too. A taste test? It's a taste test. <laughs> <laughs> and what spoon should I use? Mm. Is it healthy? It's very healthy. Up next, we are taking apples from sweet to sweeter with one of my favorite fall treats, apple dumplings with a homemade caramel sauce. You don't want to miss this. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. 
NBC News, streaming free now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Till and Dishes, Cooking with Cal. Today's episode is all about using a favorite fall staple, apples. Next up, Cal and I are making apple dumplings with a homemade caramel sauce. This recipe takes a bit more time, a bit more patience, but I promise it's worth it. I first saw this recipe in Better Homes and Gardens' new cookbook. So here's how to make one of my favorite fall treats. There are a lot of steps, but it's still pretty easy, okay? There's only three things. We need the caramel sauce that goes on top, We've got the apples that we're going to fill with this little filling, and we're gonna wrap it in pastry dough. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this is a hot apple. That's a nice apple. Let's add the water. She can't eat everything. Pour in the sugar. Mom? Yes. Yeah. And I'm just gonna do half this cinnamon, not all of it. So I'm gonna bring this up to a boil, and this is gonna be our caramel sauce. We still have some things to do. You ready to make the filling? All right, what do you think those are? Mm -hmm. Walnuts. Walnuts. And what are those? Raisins. Raisins. I'm gonna add 
Honey. Add a tablespoon of honey. This is gonna be our filling for the apples. Dump the salt into the flour. All the salt? Yeah. Do you know what this is? Mm -mm. What do you think it is? I don't know. This is called a shortening. You wanna make the shortening look like little bits of peas in here. What happens if we eat it? It would taste disgusting. Ready? Like press it down and twist. There you go. Press and twist. Press it hard. All right, now we're gonna add the half and half. Now can I pour it? What are we making? Apple dumplings, remember? Oh, yummy? Yeah. Is this dessert? It is a dessert. When it's done, can I eat one of it? Of course. And you? Yes. Smell it smells so good. Oh, it smells like pastry. What are you doing? Um, can we not put your face in the dough? I'm glad it's just us eating it. All right, here we go with our dough. Oh no, we make the hole. No, um, don't make a hole. Why? Cause no more holes, no holes. I need you to start here. Okay. And end all the way over here. Nice. Put the apple here. Can you take a little bit of this? This is our spare hiding, hiding spot. A little cinnamon sugar. I'm gonna pour the sauce over the dumplings. Carefully. Do you love it? Okay, so if you want to make this apple dumpling recipe right away, you might be thinking I don't have an apple core like I used, um, but there is a way you can just cut right through the apple. It's, it's tedious, I'll tell you that. In fact, I held off making this recipe until I ordered one of these. <laughs> um, wherever you get you know, kitchen supplies, it's an easy order. Just wait a couple days until it gets there. But if you don't have patience, um, just be careful. And I wouldn't recommend doing this part with the kids because you need a very sharp knife and you literally just have to cut around the core of the apple. So make sure you go all the way to the bottom. This is probably the worst part of the whole recipe, is pouring the apple. My kids eat a lot of apples, and whether I'm slicing them or dicing them or doing whatever it is with apples, there's just no good way to get the seeds out. But this, this works pretty well. Okay, so you can either do it that way if you don't have patience, although I think this way is the way to go. So this is what an apple core does. Basically the same thing the knife did, just in all one big swoop. Can you get it in there? Twist it, pull it up, and there you go. That was easier, right? So I'd recommend just holding off a couple days on this recipe and wait till you get your apple core. I mean, because that's perfect. So to core the apple with a knife, you wanna make sure you use a paring knife. They're nice and sharp, they're tiny. If you use anything bigger, I feel like you're gonna cut the whole apple up. Um, and a steak knife would just never work for this. So get yourself a paring knife too. <laughs> For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. I'll do the chocolate chips. No, I want to. Oh, fine. Yay. Let's, you, let's pour it at the same time, Alexander. Three, Three two, two, one. Whee! My name's Alexander Charbonnet, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. is Alexander Charbonnet. I'm seven years old and I'm in second grade. I started cooking when I was five for my mom and my dad and my sister. I started my cooking channel two years ago when I was five. Hi guys, hi friends, welcome to my show. 
Kids can cook with Chef Alexander. We are making banana muffins with no egg. Cause I'm allergic to egg. My egg allergy um, makes me sad, but I'm more sad because I can eat stuff like other people. Because of my allergy, I can't eat cookies or donuts or like cakes or like a lot of stuff. My mom is awesome because she makes eggless stuff like cookies, cupcakes, and regular cakes. But my mom and I bring um, treats like cookies without egg to school with me so I can enjoy it with my friends. My little sister has a peanut allergy. She can have like peanut butter and jelly. So I feel like she's a special too. My mom was the one who taught me how to cook. Um, my favorite part of cooking is I get to spend special time with my mom cooking. My favorite hobbies are playing video games, um, riding my bike, riding my scooter. Um, I also really love dinosaurs. Here's some, a fact of some dinosaurs. Did you know that the Allosaurus does, doesn't have serrated teeth? And it actually uses jaw. He, he opens his mouth and he slashes his upper jaw into its prey like a hammer. We are making donut chocolate donut cakes. So we have this flour, so we're gonna dump it into the sieve. <laughs> I wanna be a pastry chef because I'm already a pastry chef. I am so excited because today we are making eggless trini macaroni pie and blender muffins with apples, bananas, and carrots. First we're gonna start with the macaroni pie. Here's everything we need to start with. We got butter, we got olive oil, cut up onions, onion powder, garlic powder, black pepper, flour, mustard, cheese, salt, but we also need elbow and pasta and milk. First we're gonna make the cheese sauce. First we're gonna melt the, the butter the, and the olive oil over medium heat. Now the next step we need to add the onions. Make sure you cook it for a few minutes because we don't want the smell of the onions to make us cry. The next step, you need to add the flour and you need to make a roux. A roux is fat mixed with flour. You need to um, whisk it so it doesn't give that raw flour taste. That would taste horrible. This is what's gonna thicken the sauce since I'm not using egg. Now we need to add the milk to the pot, but make sure to add it slowly because we don't want it to spot all over the pot. Now we need to whisk it until it's fully incorporated. Next, we're gonna add the mustard. Now we're ready to put in the spices. We got our onion powder, the garlic powder in, and the black pepper in. And the salt, let's put in the salt too. Bubbling, it looks like lava. This is what we're looking for. I wish you guys can smell this. Cause it really smells good. Now for the best part, we put in the cheese. Now we're going back to mixing. The sauce looks like this. This is a little hot, so you know who I need? Mommy!
Almost there. Up. Oh. It's important to incorporate the pasta into the cheese sauce. We're gonna put in a grease baking dish and then we're gonna top it off with cheese. This looks great. Now we're just gonna add some cheese to on the top. I need to pop this in the oven, so I need to call mom again. Mom! Oh, it looks good. Okay, I'm gonna open the oven. Okay. Thanks, mom. Oh no, thank you. Good job. We're gonna let it bake for 25 or 30 minutes. This looks awesome. It wouldn't be complete without my favorite person. Mmm. Mm. Yeah. We come from a long line of foodies in our family, a long line of cooks, and you're just carrying on that tradition by continuing to be one of the chefs in our family. <laughs> to stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're gonna be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now we're gonna make one of my favorite recipes, the blender muffins without egg. They have apples, carrots, and bananas, but to help me, I'm gonna have my sister, Natalie. So we're gonna make introduce yourself, Nellie. Okay, so my name is Natalie, and I'm going in kindergarten soon. And my my favorite food is fruits and vegetables. Five, I'm five, and I'm Alexander's sister. And my nickname and, is Peanut. And her nickname's Peanut, but she has a peanut allergy. But this also has um, no eggs, so it's Isn't that funny, guys? Peanut. Now we have this big mixing bowl, so now we're gonna put, it, put in all our dry ingredients. Let's start with the flour. Put in the brown sugar. Up, oh, flop, up, oh, there's still some. There you go. Put it back. Now we need to put in the white sugar. Now, now we put in baking powder. And My now turn. Let's put in baking soda. Now let's put in some cinnamon, like for cinnamon rolls. Let's mix. Let's make finger muffins. Mix, 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 mix up. <laughs> Agitate all around. Okay. Okay. Your turn. Now we need the blender, and now we're going to ask Mom for the blender. Mom! Now we're going to add the 
the apples, the carrots, and bananas to the blender. Let's start with the apples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plop, plop. It's time for carrot time. And guys, in case you know, these are for our bunnies, but we use them for baking now. Let's put the banana peel in. Break it in half and then put the other half in. That might be smart. Going to float. <laughs> it looks weird. I wonder. I'm trying to get the ones in the on the back. Maybe we should do it together. Let's mix and agitate, agitate, agitate. Let's mix and agitate. Let's do that. Mm -mm -mm. Now let's add. I'll add the Put butter. Let's do it. Three, two, one. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'll do the chocolate chips. No, I want to. No. Fine. Yay. Let's, do, do let's pour it at the same time, Anja. Three, two, one. Whee! Wait, the oats. Oh, this looks good. Now we have our muffin tin. Yep. We get to spray our muffin tin. Yeah, we need to do it three quarter way full. How about you scoop it and I put it in? Ready to go in the oven now. And now let's get mom. Now it's going to take 18 to 22 minutes. Bye, we'll see you on the next day. I get my, I just want to gobble them all up and I'm out. These have been cooling for 10 minutes, so they're ready to eat. Makes the yummy drink. Welcome to another Read with Jenna book club discussion. I am so excited because I get to be here to talk with you about one of my favorite books. It was our April book club pick called Memphis. And of course, I'm thrilled that Tara Stringfellow, the author of this novel, is joining us here in person. She is going to take us behind the scenes of writing this chilling and hopeful debut. Tara, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you all so much for having me. Oh my gosh. Such I'm, an honor. I need more with you. But <laughs> You know what's so 
interesting about this book is it's all about the history of this family. Yes. It gets like really into the relationships right. to who comes before us. And is it true that you had a professor that said, yes. Tara, research your ancestry, find out what happened in your family and write about it. Yes, uh, Reginald Gibbons, I call him Reg, at <laughs> Northwestern University. This was actually a poem at first, a little narrative poem. And after he, you know, edited the poem, he pushed it across the desk and he said this, this should be a novel. He said this should be a novel, but he said, so look into your family. So how did you, yes, what did he, you do? He told me, so Northwestern, thankfully, you know, for all of us students, we have free ancestry accounts. So I went down to the Northwestern wow. library and I was able to pull my grandfather's draft card. And I found out he was a World War II hero. Did you not know that? Previously? I had no idea. So I got to call my mother and tell her that her father fought in World War II, wow. was a hero. I found out he uh, was part of a unit that liberated Buchenwald, mm -hmm. the Nazi concentration camp. He saved the children. Ugh. And that's something. And, and did that inspire yes. this? Yes. Tell me how. Oh my goodness. Well, in when I heard way. that story, yeah. just in and of itself, I was blown away. I mean, the, the fact that he's a hero, an American hero, and I would come home to Memphis and not see any monuments made for him. Mm. And he came home from the war, he became the first black homicide detective in Memphis. Mm -hmm. You know, where are the monuments for him? Mm -hmm. So Memphis is my monument to him. Let's talk a little bit more about the trajectory of your writing mm. career. It wasn't linear. No, no. Although you did know from the time you were a little girl that you wanted to write. Yes. So talk to me about why you went into law, what happened, how you kind of reeled back. Yeah. And if you feel like you're living your black fairy tale. Oh, yes, definitely. No, I love being an attorney, you know, and it helped me write. You know, I can write anything yeah. now, um, but I knew it wasn't for me. I couldn't do that kind of work every day. I, I didn't feel whole mm. at night, and I only feel whole when I have some paper and some pen. And Is that how you do it? Is that your process? Oh yeah, I wrote this whole book on paper. Okay, we're the same person. Yes. <laughs> I do that too, and people, and then did you go back? And then I went to the computer. When it was ready, I sketched all my chapters out in a little moleskin uh, journal that I have, and then I transfer it to the computer. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when did you decide, I'm gonna leave law? I got into Northwestern's MFA program for poetry. None of the law firms in Chicago would let me be an attorney and then go to school at night for poetry. So they kind of pushed me out and I took odd jobs. I was like a secretary mm -hmm. for a while, just anything I could find. Um, I ate dollar tacos and drank yellowtail <laughs> <laughs> for years. And I wrote this book and I went to school at night, uh, much like Miriam mm -hmm. in the book. And I, I went through my own divorce too and kind of started over and I've never been so happy writing in a little one bedroom apartment, no money. I'd never been so completely myself. And so you know, it paid off. It did. And, and <laughs> we're we here were now. Saying, you know, Hoda and I were saying after you left, after you got off the air, that, that you are going to be the inspiration oh. for so many who oh. are, you know, working in something that isn't inspiring them. Yeah. And that takes courage though. We've got to talk about Memphis as a place. Let's, We've that's my favorite to thing to Memphis talk about. As a place, I know that it, you just love it. That it's your <sighs> yeah. essence of who you are. And I could feel that when you were talking about your little yellow door. Yeah. And, but you've mo lived all over the world. All over. What brought you home? Oh gosh, I mean, in a nutshell, kind of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom's a nurse in Memphis and I didn't want her, you know, to be alone. Mm. And so I uh, packed up and I moved back home um, July 2020 with everyone else during COVID. I didn't know if the book would ever see the light of day. At that point when you moved home, where was Memphis in its gestation? I mean, I don't know if oh, I've ever used that, but yeah. where was it? Was it a draft? Were you, was it an outline? Had you already written most of it? I've written most of it, but then during the editing process, I the draft that was submitted put that aside and I rewrote it. So during COVID, the start of COVID, March 2020, I rewrote this book in about nine, 10 months. And I finished in August. And that's, that's what we have 
in front of us. Yeah. I really, I took COVID as an opportunity to uh, create this. So much of, of fear. Yes. In, in our yeah. country at that time. But one of the things that I keep telling everybody about this book is that, of course, it's about trauma that's passed down yeah. through generations. Yeah. But it's also about love, yeah. uh, joy. Joy. Joy, joy and hope and I, mm -hmm. I wonder if some of that came out of the time you were writing it came out of this time which was a very hard time for our country yeah. in so many different ways oh my goodness my mother tells me all the time she says in times of extreme sorrow we pray and in times of extreme joy we pray mm. and so Memphis was my prayer you know I wanted to to actively pray, and that's mm -hmm. how I do it with writing. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it's hopeful. I, all of us poets are optimists, <laughs> you know? We like to sit outside and look at trees and write. Yeah, of, course, of course we're gonna be happy. So I wanted every single page to have some sort of black joy. Yes black sisterness yes, and coming yes. together. Um, so I'm glad that shown. It did. Our stories, yeah. our origin stories right. are what drive us. And, yes. and you wouldn't have gotten to this incredible book without digging in. No. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. good. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The dedication of this book, oh, I read it on the air the other day. I saw that. You did such a great job. I Thank read you. it because I saw it on Instagram. Somebody else posted it. Yeah. And when I first received a copy of this book, the dedication took my breath away. I just Aww. couldn't believe how gorgeous it was. And it is a poem in so many ways. Yeah. Do you mind reading I it for us? I would love to. It'd be an honor. Unfortunately, you know, George Floyd died mm -hmm. while I was writing the book on May 30th. And um, my grandfather also was lynched on May 30th, but in 1960. And so I woke up that next day on the 31st and I just kind of, I wrote the dedication and in a sitting, a few minutes. I just knew it had to be to Miss Gianna Floyd. Mm -hmm. I wrote you a black fairy tale. And I understand if you're not ready to read it yet, or if your mama told you to wait a bit, that's just fine. This book ain't going nowhere. This book gonna be right here, whenever you want it. Whenever you get finished playing outside in that bright, beautiful world your daddy loved so much. Child, it's just right to set this aside. Lord knows, not a soul on this earth gonna blame you for being out in it. Running, laughing, breathing. Oh. I'm like, we need an audience in here to clap, but I'm sure at home y'all feel just as moved as me. Oh, don't cry. I, I know I am, I am, but that is so beautiful. Thank you And so I wonder, much. I didn't know, I did know about your grandfather's story and you weave it in mm -hmm. to this story. Yeah. So much of him is in this story. Talk about that and, and if, what it was like 
writing it, um, especially when in 2020 we're dealing with some of the same issues? Yeah, I. It was remarkable finding his draft card. I felt like I stumbled upon an actual artifact, you know, and my grandfather died when my mom, you know, was little, mm -hmm. and so I don't have anything of his. So it felt, I felt a connection mm -hmm. to my grandfather, mm -hmm. and I said, okay, you better write his chapters good, mm -hmm. girl. Like, those mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. sing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an incredible amount of pressure, I felt, you know, um, to do my family good, mm -hmm. you know, to bring some honor mm -hmm. to our name. But it was also just a joy mm. to write. Um, it was cathartic. It felt like I was connecting myself to my roots and getting to know my family better. Tell a little bit more about, for those who haven't read the book, his story okay. very much mirrors. Yes. Um, and, and the fact that he was uh, a police chief. Yeah. And then went on to be lynched. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, Lord. Um, He's done so much for the city. You know, in doing research, I found out that he caught a serial rapist. Oh my gosh. In Memphis, he was in Jet Magazine. There's a picture of him. With, with, you know, like he's, he's, he was an incredible force um, and did so much good for black folk down in Memphis. And, you know, the fact that there's still so much mystery around his death and what happened. Um, I wish I did know more about that. I could do a lot yes. more research, honestly, yeah. with this book, um, but I had to kind of stop. <laughs> and, and well, and also right. it's part of your story, but it obviously is a novel, yeah. so it's fictionalized. Yes. And so you needed also, did you feel like you needed the space? Yeah, but also the primary documents were really helpful. Yeah. You know, there's a part in the book, I don't want to give too much away, yeah. where the neighborhood, I say, is all stands watch mm. on the lawn. Mm -hmm. That is not fiction. When my grandfather died, all of Douglas came and he, they stood on the lawn all night mm. saluting the house. Oh my God. That's just the kind of neighborhoods we live in in yeah. Memphis. Um, even my neighborhood, I live in North Memphis, my neighbors, Save my life every day. Honestly, like I could not, I wouldn't be here. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We had so many people interested in the narrative of this book, and so I've got to ask some okay. other questions. Elise Wagner asked, which character did, from the family did you start writing first Ooh. and whose voice did you enjoy writing the most i loved that question oh who was the first it was probably della mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, she was probably the first because, yeah, just how it's set up, she's probably Do you the first. write chronologically? Is that I how did. You, is that how you write? Interesting. I did. And, and did you ever have to go back and think, okay, wait, did I cover this? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> Because it spans decades. Right, and 70 years. Yeah. And so I had a great help. Katie Nishimoto, my editor at Penguin Random House, helped, you know, divvy up the chapters and put them in some sort of lineage that builds tension yes. and, you know, makes it interesting. But Della was probably the first character I wrote. And then my favorite voice, that's hard. I mean, I, I love all of Is there the one women? that was easier to write for you or one? Probably Maya. Yeah. You know, parlo italiano. I speak Italian. So whenever Maya would speak Italian, I loved writing because I said, oh, I don't need a translator. I got this. We talked a little bit about Myron, you know, and your yeah. own grandfather story. But I wonder how Myron and Hazel's lives and deaths reverberate throughout yeah. the future of their generations. I mean, that right. is sort of when we talk about intergenerational trauma, which is something right. that's being studied a lot. You know, what? how did that they as sort of the founders, the matriarch and the patriarch yeah. of this family. How does it go down to, to all of the North family? Well, especially, well, I would say Della and Hazel, yeah. you know, and even yes. Myron. I, I feel as if Joan gets her love of art from Myron. Yeah. You know, he does the house and he paints it. Yeah. And he puts little notes in, yes. into the wallpaper and things. So he's an artist, too. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where Joan's gift of art comes from. Mm. Um, the fact that, you know, Della is a seamstress, I think, um, you know, really inspired Auntie August mm -hmm. to open her own beauty shop yeah, and her own. Yeah. yeah, they're all very pioneering, progressive women, mm -hmm. self-made women. And that was purposeful. Memphis as a city has more black and female owned businesses, I think, than anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to make sure my characters were self-made mm -hmm. black women because most of, most of my girlfriends in Are. Memphis own yeah. their own business, yeah. looking at them like yeah. in awe, like how yeah. do y'all run a business yes. <laughs> and they just do it every day. And uh, I'm just so proud of Memphis women. So mm -hmm. that's why they're all, I think that's what, what that's what carries over the, the, the self-made pioneering spirit mm -hmm. of the women. You say there's a sliver of you in each of the characters. I think so. Each of these women that mm -hmm. are just incredible. Can you quickly talk us through. Hi. I'm like, do you want me to get the family tree? I know. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like Auntie August and I don't want to be bothered. I just want a cigarette and be in my kimono <laughs> in my home. Like, who are these people? I like, leave. Sometimes I feel like Miriam and that I had to start over yeah. and leave my own uh, marriage and go to school at night and put myself through without any help, without any money. Um, sometimes I, I mean, I always feel like Joan when she's yes, painting, I artist. feel that, yeah, I feel that way when I'm writing. Um, I feel like Maya whenever I'm cutting up and getting into trouble and doing things I shouldn't be mm -hmm, doing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, yeah, all of the women are a part of me. It was really easy to write. I was going to say, and it's really hard to choose your favorite character. Oh, I can't choose. So Corey S. asked, um, has writing Memphis been cathartic for you? Oh, yeah. Has it helped you to work through any past traumas? Mm. Yes, I mean, all of writing does that for me. I can't even explain how I feel after I finished a poem. Yeah. It's bliss. Yeah. Like, I feel uh, like I'm, yeah, everything makes sense. So whenever I take up a pen. NBC News, streaming free. Now. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you.
news is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Feel a kind of way, but especially this book. You know, this is my first time writing fiction. Yeah. I've never written a short Which story. Which is remarkable. Before. I've never written a short story. Like, I just said, hey, let me see what I can do. <laughs> so no. a part of it was really fun. Yeah. You know, just writing for fun. I mean. Well, and also, I wonder, too, because we were writing, you were writing during a time where we were all separated. All so right. I wonder if that's part of why there's so much community. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know, but yeah. there's, it's, I do feel like you're going to look back and think because of when you were writing this novel that this is always going to, and it's also your first. Yeah. It's going to be special forever. I loved this question. I want to know if there's a particular playlist that you okay. use to help you write about bluff, the Bluff City so accurately. Memphis is so rich in music, so that yeah. would make sense. I did create a Memphis yeah. playlist. Yeah, I think it's on our Read yes. Virginia Instagram. So I, I say go look for yes. that. But then while I was writing the book, and even today this morning in your green room, I was just <laughs> listening to opera. I love Maria Callas. She calms me down, and I, you know, I... I listen to opera when I was studying for the bar. When I'm writing, I listen to opera. There's just something about opera for me. You're a true renaissance woman. I'm like, what do you not do? <laughs> That's no. amazing. And the Memphis playlist is so good, by the way. I love it. So go to our Instagram page, because I think it's like a great way to, to, to look at the music that that makes Memphis so, so, so special. <sighs> yeah. Um, okay, so when we think about sisterhood mm. in this book yeah. and, you know, where we are as a country, mm. um, I wonder, I wonder, you say this is a black fairy tale and there is so much joy in it. Do you, how much farther do we have to go and what can we do um, to make sure we're, we're supporting our communities and oh each other? Goodness. I know that's a big question, but I, I feel like if anybody can answer it, it's you. I'll try. <laughs> Where can we go as a country? You know, um, I'm reminded often of the Martin Luther King uh, quotation, you know, when the history books are written, the historians will have to look back and say there lived a great peoples, mm. a peoples with fleecy locks and dark skin but a peoples who injected new meaning into the veins of civilization, mm. a people who has saved Western civilization at her darkest hour. And I try to do that with Memphis. I try to inject new meaning into the veins of the Western canon. I wanted just for a moment for all of literature to look at black women yeah. as, as women, not as a stereotype or a caricature, but a character, mm -hmm. a full-bodied, three-dimensional human being, because that's what we are. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I've done that. You've done that. And I don't know what America has to do some work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have to do some work. Yeah. But I think we are, and having this conversation in and of itself yeah. is, is doing the work. I wonder, like, who has inspired you to take now, look at you, you're part of this incredible group of writers who are yeah. changing the narrative. So what, tell me. Well, you know, I grew up reading poetry. Yeah. So a lot of my favorite, like, people are poets. So Nikki Giovanni, yeah. Sonia Sanchez, mm. uh, Lucille Clifton, um, Carolyn Rogers. Those are really the women who kind of did it for me. I love Harlem Renaissance poetry, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So County Cullen, mm -hmm. Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. um, Frank Horn. I just, I love poetry. I know I should yeah. come up here and talk about novels, yeah. but I, I mean, as a little girl, I was obsessed with Ellen Montgomery. Mm. I, re I read every single thing that woman has ever <laughs> read. I just thought I was Anne. You yes, know? Like, yes. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions that I want to get to. So, um, Catherine C. asked, the characters you create in Memphis are so rich in depth and in strength, which is mm. true. Who are some women who've inspired you? <sighs> That's easy, my mom. Yeah. You know, she took off work today just to be able to watch the show, but she's usually asleep because she works 14-hour shifts, three shifts in a row. I don't know 
how the woman does and saves <laughs> lives every day. Like it's, it makes what I do seem very, very minimal. Um, so my mother is a huge, and she put herself through school. And in the book, she raises two children, but in real life, she raised three. Wow. On her own, you know, driving a van across country with us. Wow. To start over. So some of that story is based on your mom. Yeah. And just seeing her, she'd fall asleep at night on top of her nursing books, and I'd see her, and I'd put a quilt over her and make breakfast for everybody the next day so she's a huge inspiration what did she think when she read memphis she read it in a night wow and she called me in the middle of the night i was in the outer banks and she called me and she was just crying she said i didn't think that you'd remember i hope she's proud i'm sure <laughs> i hope yawn. she's proud. proud shakita moore and we, we don't have that much time but i want to okay. get um to this question i think i know but just uh to kind of wrap it up in some ways. She wanted to say, what or who inspired you to write this book? I mean, all of black women in Memphis, really, especially us Southern women. And I really wanted to make a gift for us. I wanted something that'll be on the shelf for hundreds of years mm -hmm. to honor the women in my city. They're so, again, so hardworking, so driven so passionate and just beautiful people like the the women of douglas the women on chelsea on jackson off poplar those are some those those women have always made this country great mm. okay we're gonna finish here august once says to joan she says free a black uh, woman hasn't ever known the mm. meaning of that word, my love. But by the end of the novel, Jones says, contrary to what August told her, that she does feel free. What, why, why end the book that way? Mm. And I wonder if writing, you know, how do you feel as oh, a yeah. black woman living in our country? Oh, wow. Well, I wanted to talk about freedom from the perspective of black women. Mm -hmm. I feel like when freedom is talked about, even, you know, it's yeah. always very male yeah. driven, like freedom, yeah. but, <laughs> you know, but we, we engage in freedom too. And what does it mean to be free? Um, yes, I feel free mm -hmm. in this country. It's been a hard road, but I live in a black city, um, in a black neighborhood. And so I feel very comfortable, you know, um, but it's, it's taken some time, it has. And I think we still, again, have a long way to go in making sure that every mm -hmm. black woman feels free, not just me, you know, mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I still come from a very entitled place, mm -hmm. um, you know, and oh, Lord, what, what do we all have to do in order to that? But I think it's our American duty yeah. for every American to say, I am free in this country and feel it. Mm -hmm. Does writing help give you that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm doing what I'm made to do. I do feel like that, that I was put here on this earth yeah. for a purpose and I'm fulfilling it. I can't believe I'm here with you mm -hmm. today. It's, it's it, it, I woke up like, am I dreaming? <laughs> like I go to sleep at night, I have dreams about the book, I wake up and it's happening. <laughs> so I'm very blessed. This is a huge blessing for me. And I do have to say thank you. You've done not just me, but the city of Memphis a great honor today, well, so I appreciate it. When you just said it's all our duty, you're fulfilling it by writing these, this incredible, incredible story, this beautiful narrative filled with hope and joy. And I just am so in love with this book. I wanna thank you so much for writing it, putting it out into the world. So many have read it and loved it. And I just want to thank you, thank you for thank being you here, so Tara. Much. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all of our Read with Jenna followers out there. Have a great day, everybody. Follow us on Instagram so you can get Tara's yes. playlist. Yes. Um, and a special thank you to Xfinity, who paid to produce this program. Xfinity and today's parent company, NBC Universal, are both owned by Comcast. Keep on reading, everybody, and thank you so much for being here today. Hi guys, it's so great to see you. By the way, first of all, I love this friendship. I'm, I love it, I love it. And Billy, is it, is, do I have the story right? You're watching SNL like you do on Saturday nights and on pops this amazing human being who like captivates you.
I was blown away. I mean, I, I had not seen Girl Trip. So when she came on, I went, who is this? And she was so great and funny and charming. And, and she wore this beautiful white dress. And, and she just was, and in the sketches, she was sensational. So I, I you know, know we had finished the draft and I, and I called Alan and I said, watch it, did, 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 that's who, we have to get her, we have to get her. And fortunately we did. So Tiffany, how did you learn that Billy Crystal had his eye on you and said, that's the girl I want for this role? My, um, well, first the universe told me Billy is coming and I was like, Billy who? <laughs> no, uh, I had a dream. No, no, my agent called me and was like, uh, Billy Crystal would like to talk to you. He would like to meet with you. And I was like, Billy Crystal wants to talk to me? Are you serious? And it's like, yes. And so I remember, I was like, set it up. So I remember the day before I was like, uh, my hair, I had just took my hair out of some braids and I was like, oh, should I go natural? Should I, what should I do? Should I, should I press my hair? Should I, what should I do with my hair? Like, do I need to put on makeup? I was like, you know what? I'm gonna show up supernatural. I'm gonna come all the way through. And if he, if he, if he like me, it'd be cool. If he, if he just trying to use me for something, <laughs> then he probably be like, I'm good. I came through with an Afro, no makeup on. And was like, and I think I was late. You would know you were jet, you were jet lagged. Cause you would just, you were just flown in from Africa. But if I'm yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yep. Really first we, impression of Tiffany when she walked in. Uh, that's the girl. That's, that's who she is. That's, um, and then when we talked about the script and she told me what was going on in her personal life um, and she's, and I was going on and on and she goes, you don't have to talk anymore. I'm, basically you had me at hello, yeah. you know, let, let's, let's just do this. And so, um, you know, the qualities that we, that was amazing that, that we, we hope to get in the character um, were just naturally uh, Tiffany and that became naturally Emma. Well, Billy, when you, um, the last time you directed, I think was your, uh, was 61. I think that was right. the last time. So right. I was thinking if you were going to. Not in 1961. <laughs> I'm not, I'm right. not, that old, no. the movie was called 61 yeah. asterisk, which actually is having, uh, it's going to be on, uh, well, can I say HBO? I guess I did. Yeah. It's our 20th anniversary of that movie. So that was the last time I directed so for yeah. you to pick a project or come up with a project um, or you, you would have to fall in love with it. And this is something that you've been working on for three years now. So tell us about the genesis. How did it start? Well, my my dearest friend, um, Alan Zweibel, who was an original SNL writer and worked with me on my Broadway show, 700 Sundays, uh, was on a David Letterman show talking about this horrible auction lunch that he had where somebody purchased him to have lunch with him. And she only paid $22. And he was really depressed about that. But then worse, she has a, a toxic reaction to a seafood salad that she was eating. She has a terrible shock. He has to get an ambulance. She doesn't have insurance. So this, uh, this charity luncheon cost him $2,000. And he told the story on David Cho. And I thought it was, while he's, uh, while he's talking, I'm writing him saying, Alan, this is the beginning of something. I don't know where it goes, but what a great way for these two to meet. Well, and I had, been, I had been contemplating trying to write a story about a relation, intergenerational relationship between an older man and, and a younger woman that was about friendship and love and trust, not in a romantic way. And, and that's how it started. Well, I love that the genesis is humor. You're cracking up at the beginning. And when I learned about the beginning of this, I was like, well, that sounds like Tiffany to a T. But this movie, Tiffany, takes you down other beautiful roads, roads that I'm so happy to see you go down, like it's fun to watch on the screen. So the humor part, you knew you had that, obviously. How did you feel about the rest? Because this is a very beautiful story, a very kind of heavy story. Well, I felt really good about everything. And uh, the only thing I had an issue with is when Billy was asking me to cry and I was like, uh, I've been spending 39 years of my life suppressing tears, uh, not crying in front of people. Uh, do you know how hard it was to train myself to turn all tears into jokes and laugh? And like, he's like, well, I need you to cry. I want you to cry. I'm like, I, I, can't, I can make a cry face, but don't cry. <laughs> he's like, no, I want you to cry. I'm like, I can. I can give the, the the emotion of crying, but not actually crying. It's like, no, I want you to cry. And I'm like, uh, 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 uh. 
and, and how, he got it out of me. How did you, yeah. what, what did you have to think about, Tiff, for that to happen? I actually just stayed in the moment, just listen, yeah. listened, listened. That was something just, that yeah. Billy really taught me, like just, like I, I knew that already, but just to really not think about myself and think about what is happening right mm -hmm. now, be right here, right now, listen, be there. Um, and it was hard because I do it with my friends in real life, but to do it with the whole crew around and, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just, I've been trained, I've trained myself to be like, when I'm hurting, when I'm feeling like, or, or when I'm feeling like busting out with the, you know, Viola Davis snot tears, just <laughs> make a joke, do something, laugh, swallow those tears, like do something yes. to make it go away. And Billy was like, don't do it. Wow. Just be. And, and the kid, the, I remember the shot. It was a close up of her, and she's hearing the story about the secret sadness in my life. And I'm finally um, telling her. So the camera was behind me. So I could talk to her, um, uh, just move her into it, not even doing a dialogue from the, from the script. Because, you know, I could always put that in because it was behind me. And I just talked to her gently. And, to, and she's, I'm fighting, and I just don't. And I got her to, we got the moment that we needed. And it was, it was thrilling as a, to watch. And it was thrilling, I have to say, as a director to get her there. Um, mm -hmm. And I, we both learned a lot in, in, in that moment. That's what I love about, uh, about making movies in particular, the wonderful surprises um, mm -hmm. that happen. And, the, and if you're willing, like she was, um, right from the first day to to go there and and be this person and, and yes the hilarious Tiffany is in the movie for sure but there's another side of her that I always sensed about her once we started to know each other mm -hmm. that we were able to you know get into the movie and she's spectacular in the film yeah now I can cry at the drop of a dime well anywhere, anytime. <laughs> and well, by the way speaking of that miss I don't know if you know this, Billy, I'm sure you do, but your girl here won a Grammy Award for Best Comedy Album. Mm -hmm. And I was so incredibly moved. She was up against Jim Gaffigan and Jerry Seinfeld and kind of the, the guys who are always in the running. And there's Miss Tiffany and she gets a call while she's on the set of her show, Kids Say the Darndest Things. And she can't believe that this is truly happening. For me, I'm just happy with being nominated personally. I've won, that I've been means nominated a couple of times. You say, what? I've been so, no, you've been nominated a couple of times. Yeah, I've been nominated a couple of times for some things. But I just and won I a Grammy. And I love, I just what? You just won a you Grammy. just love being nominated. I just, I just won a Grammy? No. I just, are you, are you serious? And living in that moment with you, Tiffany, are you still thinking about it right now? I'm about to cry right <laughs> Swallow, swallow. Wait, no, let, I don't know what to do. Hoda, your skin looks amazing. You look gorgeous today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I want to know what the treatment no, is. You are I mean, doing your shoulders it. Shoulders look so smooth and soft. You know what you're doing, <laughs> Tiffany? You're doing it again. You're doing it again. But to, not only did you have that moment, Tiffany, those little, those little girls watching, you had it. And all I could think of was you just made everything possible in a nanosecond. Right? I just, I felt like, First of all, wow, I won this. Second, it was, wow, these young ladies no are our real. future. I really and they what? just realized that they can do anything. Mm. And in any moment, they can be blessed with, with whatever they desire. And all I desired was to bring joy and happiness. That's it. That's all I've ever desired. And bring joy, happiness, wherever I go. Billy, did you know Tiffany's backstory, her her life story? Did you know about? I did not, not until not until we met, and then I read her book, and um, and then we talked a lot about it, and um, you know that's for sure. I know, having lived longer than than both of you, that the longer you know we're here, and the more material you have to infuse your work with with real good stuff. You know, the, and if you're real honest about it, and, and um, there's so much to draw on, and her life is is full of amazing twists and turns, and and hardships and joy, and and that's who you see. And I saw that moment um, 
uh, when she when she was told that she won, and and I was moved because I know how important it was to her, but also how grateful she was and 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 is for the success that she's having, and I think that was you know really disarmingly beautiful. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Your, your character, Billy, in this movie um, suffers from dementia. And I, there was a beautiful line, I'm trying to remember it, and I don't remember it exactly, but you basically said you want to laugh. You don't want to be afraid anymore. You want to write your last project. I was just picturing everyone at home, no matter what you're dealing with, that would be what you want. How did you, how did you get into character? What were you thinking about in those moments? Well, the, the, the genesis for the character was, was twofold. Um, I was dealing with a, my last remaining relative, um, who was an aunt, who was a, a novelist and, a, and an editor for the Book of the Month Club. And it was a really brilliant woman who started, as she said to me, I'm losing my words. And I thought that was like so mm -hmm. impactful. So when Alan and I started writing, we channeled uh, together um, a writer uh, at SNL who we both really loved and respected named Herb Sargent. And uh, when SNL first came on in 75, you know, Herb was in his 50s and nobody else was. And he was this senior writer who was really in charge of Weekend Update and writing jokes for that and editing. And, and I thought, well, that's a great prototype. And then I just channeled in, what if a comedy writer was losing his words? And, 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 he, and he's got this past that he, he needs to get out and, and, and give to the world and to his kids. And he can't do it because... It's getting all of this, this interference. And um, so that, that was really, I thought it was really a kind of a poetic and, and an interesting kind of guy to play. So it was not that it was easy, but I was, as one of the writers, I was in him hmm. for, you know, a year, year and a half um, until it was time to get to the set. And then, hmm. then it would just, you just let it go and mm -hmm. just so it feels true. Um, it's so beautiful. I think people will expect a comedy, but we'll get, I mean, we'll get so much more. And I'm looking at you guys and I, I feel like you're in different stages of your love lives. I mean, Billy, I think you've been married for 50 years to Janice. Yeah, I'll be 51 years in June. 51 years. And <laughs> Tiffany, you in common, 51 days. No, more than that. <laughs> no, no, more than that. Fifty-one weeks, <laughs> but Billy, you've you've had a long, beautiful uh, marriage, and Tiffany is in love, and it's fun to watch. I feel like we get a front row seat to something so beautiful. But uh, yeah, I know you don't want to give advice on this kind of thing, but what advice would you have if if Tiffany wants to have a a beautiful, long relationship? Just be who she is. Oh. Just be who she is. I mean, um, you know, he's a lucky guy. So, are you Tiff? You're in love. <laughs> Yeah, I love him. Yes. Oh. Oh. Are you in love, Hoda? I'm in love too. Yeah, everybody. In love. In do, you, love. do you see yourself like long runway with Common? Like, do you see yourself in rocking chairs on a front porch way down the road? 
Well, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to have a front porch, but my backyard <laughs> is going to be off the chain. And we definitely will be in the backyard sitting on one of those long <laughs> bench swings with the blankets on our knees. And I'll be reading stories to them. And then I'm going to say, oh, then I'm gonna be like, I'm in the garden. You can watch. And then I'm going to bend over and pick up, pick the weeds out the garden. Yeah. <laughs> I love your love story. <laughs> so many things to love. Um, you know, I was just, I, I was looking back at when Harry met Sally oh, yes. and really how many years ago life. was that? Was that 30? More than 30? 35, it was 1989. Yeah. Do you still, Tiff, you saw when Harry met Sally. Yeah, I love that movie. What'd you love, yeah. what'd you love the most about it? I love the dynamics of their relationship and how it like grew, it blossoms like right in front of you. I love that stuff. Mm. Well, why do you think that one, Billy, ran the test of time? Um, and still does, it's yep. amazing. Um, uh, because it's real and, you know, people fall in love. Um, and, you know, there's, it's difficult sometimes to get to that place. And I think it's very human. It was a, a brilliant script and, and greatest director um, uh, and, and uh, you know, an acting partner beyond, beyond belief, you know, at that time. And so I was really blessed with, with that. And, and I'm blessed with this because this is a similar kind of mm. unlikely friendship um, that, you know, to have a friendship and the love story that's not with romance in mm. it, um, mm -hmm. almost makes it more romantic in a way. It, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, there are moments where, you know, you want them to be together, mm -hmm. um, but it's, a, it's about empathy and it's about caring. And, um, you know, the, the more I, 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 you know, got to know Tiffany, she's a, she has a great deal of empathy for people. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that was just easy to tap into. Tiffany, do you think you guys will be friends for the long haul, you and Billy? Yes, that's my <laughs> uncle. <laughs> that's your uncle. It's All right. Uncle. That's my uncle Billy. Oh, well, we love you guys. Thank you so much. We can't wait for everyone to enjoy this movie, man. You got a home run on your hands. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. All right, you got it. Bye, Tiff. Bye, Billy. All right, Bye, I'm going to need some of them skin tips. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Come on. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Who comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. I was planning on wearing this outfit to the Yankees home opener so Giancarlo Stanton could see me. My plan was to distract him so he dropped that routine pop fly because he was too busy watching me be fly. But hey, you get to see it first.
That is Tiffany Haddish co-hosting with Billy Crystal last weekend the Feeding America Comedy Festival, an event that raised money for the hunger relief organization. Haddish and Crystal will co-star in an upcoming movie called Here Today, directed by Crystal. That film is the latest stop on a life-altering three-year ride for Tiffany that began with a breakout role in the 2017 box office smash Girls Trip and has continued with movies, television, commercials, a stand-up comedy special, and a historic turn hosting Saturday Night Live. Tiffany and I got together last year for a Sunday sit-down around the release of The Kitchen, a gangster film where she stars with Melissa McCarthy and Elizabeth Moss. Step off my business. <laughs> Baby, it's my business now. Tiffany Haddish knows how to handle her business, on screen and off. I've grown up around that type of environment. I know how you have to move around those type of men, how you need to communicate with them in order to demonstrate some sort of power. What do you wear to something like that? You get dressed up? Are you kidding? And when I found out Melissa was on and then Elizabeth Moss was on, I'm like, oh, oh, this is about to be super fun. Now, mind you, I didn't know neither one of them, and I, there was a small part of me that was like, what if they're like divas? What if they're like super Hollywood chicks? Like, well, and I know how to deal with those. I'm going to be like, uh, okay, hi, and then get out their face, <laughs> right? And and what so, were you going to be like? Uh, okay, hi, and then get out of here. You know, you know, you don't talk to those people too long. But you didn't have to do that with them? Didn't have to do okay, that with good. them at all. <laughs> Turns out they weirdos just like me. <laughs> So we laughed a lot. We did a lot of online shopping. I got them to try things they never had before, like uh, pickles dipped in Kool-Aid powder. Wait a minute. Um, pickles and Kool-Aid powder? Oh, my gosh. Have you not had this? No. Okay, they said it was nasty, but that's because they don't have the, the palate. That's a hood thing. That's some gangster stuff. The 40-year-old Haddish grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Her childhood was marked by pain. Tiffany's father left the family when she was three. She was still a young girl when her mother suffered brain damage in a car accident and became abusive. I've heard a lot of comedians who've had difficult childhoods say they were doing it to make other people happy. I would try to make my mom laugh and try to make her cool because if she was laughing, she wasn't hitting. So where does this shine come from? How were you able to be so full of energy and laughter and light when you had so much um, trouble? Because I was trying to escape from the trouble. I was trying to escape from the trouble and, and uh, you know, what it say, uh, to get rid of the darkness, you got to turn on the light, you know, and I feel like I am the light. Tiffany was 12 when she and her siblings were placed into foster homes. She began to see that her light could take her places. I started working as an energy producer in high school. So somebody pay you 50, 100 bucks to go to the party and just yeah, it set started, it off? Yeah, it, it started out that low. We didn't end up <laughs> But uh, yeah, they would pay me to like come to a, a bar mitzvah, a wedding, and like MC or just dance, just be there to get people dancing. When Tiffany was 16, her social worker gave her a choice. You can either go to the Laugh Factory Comedy Camp or you can go to psychiatric therapy because something is wrong with your child. Easy choice. And, and I was like, which one got drugs? She said, you'll definitely be on drugs if you go to therapy. So, boom, I go to the comedy camp. I want to be a huge star. Not physically, but I want to be big. <laughs> and here I am today, you know, 20 some years later, telling jokes. Hanish eventually graduated from camp to the stand-up stage. But those early years of comedy were not always filled with laughs. Tiffany was homeless, living out of her car, until a fellow future star named Kevin Hart helped to change her life. I would always pull up like maybe five or 10 minutes late so nobody could see my car, because I had all my clothes, everything, suitcases all in the car. So one day I pull up a little late and he was there like the same exact time. He's like, what the hell going on in here? What's all this? What, what's, you live in your car? And he was like, well, you can't be sleeping in a car in the streets. I was like, what? I live in Beverly Hills. I sleep in Beverly Hills. I'm doing just fine. The police wake me up every morning, OK? <laughs> so he was like, Tiffany, no, no. And he gave, he gave me 300 bucks, said, find yourself a place for the week. And then write out a list of goals of what you want to do and start accomplishing those goals. And then I started attacking those goals. Haddish began to land small roles on television shows like Who's Got Jokes? I gave her five. Yes. Five. Five. Yeah, yeah. And that's so Raven. Please exit through the gift shop. 
as if you had a choice. In 2013, she played a recurring role on the BET series Real Husbands of Hollywood, starring Kevin Hart. Look like more than just your phone died. But Tiffany's breakthrough came just three years ago with a scene stealing role as Dina in the hit 2017 movie Girls Trip. I just want to say hi, that's all. No, no, no. 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 What the hell's wrong with you? It's Saturday night. That fall, another big moment as Haddish hosted Saturday Night Live in a historic performance that earned her an Emmy Award. All my friends are telling me, Tiffany, you a star now. You big time. You balling out of control. And I'm looking at my bank account like, uh-uh. Once it was all done, I was just like, OK, I made that history. Yes. I did that, because that was history. I, I mean, I was the first African-American female stand-up comedian to ever host, which I thought was crazy, because I just knew Whoopi Goldberg did it, but she just appeared in some sketches. She's never hosted? Never hosted. I thought Wanda Sykes did it. I, talked to, I, mean, I called all, all the legends, everybody that I was like, the greatest, the best of the best has had to have done this. And they're like, nope. And then I was like Googling. And I went, went through all the archives. We looked at every episode. I'm like, oh, I'm literally about to make history. I always wanted to be the first black woman to do something. Booyah. <laughs> do you ever stop and go, wow, the last two years have been insane for me? Well, every morning when I wake up, I'm like praying and I'm thankful and grateful. So I always try to find the good in everything. Because some days suck. Like, sure. I mean, I'm tired as hell right now, but I look good. <laughs> in a surprising twist, Haddish's skyrocketing career may be headed next for Japan. I have no idea what you just said. I just asked you if you speak Japanese. Where did you pick that up? Well, I went to Japan to do comedy for the troops. I started watching Japanese television, and I was like, man, this is pretty entertaining, especially the soap operas. And I didn't see any black people on the soap operas. And I thought, oh, what if I'm the first African-American to be on a Japanese soap opera? That would be dope as hell. So when I came back to the States, I got Pensler's Japanese 101, and I start playing those discs in the car when I'm sitting in traffic, you know, L.A. traffic, you sure, sit yeah. in the car for two, three hours at yeah. a time. So what happened to the Japanese soap opera idea? I'm just waiting for a call. <laughs> How has the Japanese soap opera starring Tiffany Haddish still not happened? We need it. And Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking down. Yeah. you got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition.
joining us for a Monday Pop Star Plus. Coming up, it is Broadway week here on Today, and we've got a fun peek at Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical. Plus two stars from the thrilling series, Tehran, Glenn Coase, and of course, Neve Sultan. They stop by our third hour. And later, we're going to be wishing a happy birthday to one of The Office's most lovable stars. But first, let's check out today's Pop Star headlines. Let's get to it. Martha Stewart this weekend. The home and cooking expert went viral for taking a photo at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. I don't know if you got, we showed it earlier yeah. today. Right. If you haven't seen it at home, there's the picture, of course, along with Hollywood's hottest couple. That is Kim Kardashian and Pete Davidson. We're going to get the inside scoop on what went on behind the scenes of this viral snapshot because special pop star caller Martha Stewart is on the line right now. Martha, good morning. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good. Oh, yeah. That's, isn't that a great photo? Now, now tell us the story behind that picture. <laughs> Well, um, it was the the dinner uh, was supposed to start around seven o'clock, and the president finally showed up at nine thirty. Of course, everybody was waiting for Kim Kardashian. Uh, keep, keep uh, that they were waiting for Kim and Pete, and um, and I was at the Daily Mail table, and we um, we saw them coming in, and um, and I I went over to them, and uh, I know both both you know pete, pete and i were on the justin bieber roast years ago <laughs> and that's, that's when i first met him of course and he's such a he's an adorable guy he's funny and nice and pleasant and kim looks gorgeous as usual very jealous of her of course and um and uh, we just sat we just stood and had had our pictures taken how, how did they but, seem as a couple martha uh, uh holding hands lovely mm. friendly charming you know, he's a very different kettle of fish than uh, Kanye. You know, <laughs> yeah. a, a, yes. lot, a lot of people wonder. Uh, a lot of people Don't wonder, like, it. what is it about Pete Davidson? He seems to get all right. the cute girls. So, did you figure <laughs> out what it was? Well, he's uh, he's just a skinny, kind of homely, <laughs> really nice guy. <laughs> and he was he was he was cuter when he had when he had longer curly hair. <laughs> If you, if you look at my if you look at my Instagram, you see uh, a little a little skitty did for me uh, when we were doing the roast. But but he's charming and he's nice, and I don't think he's a big deal problem. Yeah. And uh, and he's he's a, just a lovely guy. And uh, and we were just you know we were having a lovely time. The president did an amazing presentation. Yeah. You know, his like a roast there at the at the correspondence dinner. And Trevor Noah was phenomenal. So it was it was a very, very fun evening. Well, thank you, Martha. Thank you. Martha. Thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think thank what you, Martha, Martha was saying is that Pete's got game. Yeah. He's got game. Yeah. So. He's got some swag. Yeah. He's got some swag. Yeah. Martha Stewart breaking down hot hot yeah. couples <laughs> is amazing. Martha. I'd watch that show. Yeah. I'd watch that show. Uh, next up on Popstar today, Andy Cohen on Friday, the Watch What Happens Live host announced the birth of baby number two. Andy sharing a first look at his new little girl and writing, Meet my daughter, Lucy E. Eve Cohen, 8 pounds, 13 ounces, born 5.13 p.m. in New York City. Proud Papa also thanked his rock star, Sir, again, and everybody who helped make this miracle happen. And then on Sunday, Andy also shared a series of pics of Lucy's introduction to Big Brother Ben, which were adorable, so get ready for a lot of cuteness overload. Are you happy to see your little sister? Yeah. Yeah? She's sleeping. She's sleeping, right? She's making little noises. She is making little noises. This has to be tailored. Isn't it fun to have her home, Ben? Yeah, I love her. She loves you. Oh, that's just good stuff for Andy, too. I'm so happy for Andy. So happy. I saw him a couple days ago on 49th Street, going to a lunch, and he looked... Like a little it, tired. Like yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Papa Hood. Noises turn into big <laughs> <laughs> right. that Congratulations yeah. to, uh, to the family there. Next up, Carrie Underwood. It's a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll for the music superstar mm -hmm. who surprised a lot of people over the weekend. Carrie surprising fans at Stagecoach, the big music festival, by bringing out a surprise guest. Mm -hmm. That would be Axl Rose what? from Guns mm -hmm. N' Roses, the rock legend joining Underwood on stage for a duet of Sweet Child of Mine. Oh. Take
know that voice. Come on. Yeah, he also did out. Paradise City. Yeah, it sounds great. Underwood called it the best night of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, speaking of country meets rock and roll, Dolly Parton, in a recent interview on NPR, the Grammy winner, clearing up any confusion about how she feels about being nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You might remember back in March, she released a statement attempting to withdraw her name from consideration. But now she's saying she would accept the nomination gracefully. It was always my belief that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was for the people in rock music. And I have found out lately that it's not necessarily that, but if they can't go there to be recognized, where do they go? So I just felt like mm. that it was I would be taken away from some someone that maybe deserved it, and certainly more than me, because I never considered myself a rock artist. Okay. I mean, she can do no wrong. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, we all know she can. It's time to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. take a spot. Put her in the hole. We'll yeah. see how it all plays out. The 2022 Hall of Fame inductees are going to be announced sometime this month. Although it might be a little tricky to get in touch with Dolly and tell her if she's on that list. Reba McIntyre recently told Apple Music that she had to break out the fax machine <laughs> to contact Dolly last year. The two are teaming up for a reimagining of McIntyre's song "Does He Love You," and oh. apparently the fax machine is the only way that they could connect. I thought you were joking. That's no. amazing. Reba told Southern Accents Radio, quote, that's the only way I know to get a hold of her. I even asked Kenny Rogers one time. I said, do you have Dolly's cell? He said, no, you have to fax her. <laughs> All else fails, Dolly should be able to hear us cheering from New York if she does yeah. get inducted this month. And here's a few more headlines for you. First up, that 70s show. Almost the entire original cast is coming back for Netflix's upcoming spinoff series called That 90s Show. Topher Grace, Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, Laura Prepon, and Wilmer Valderrama will all be reprising their roles for the streaming services follow-up series. The new show will kick off in the year 1995. It's gonna follow Eric and Donna's daughter as she visits her grandparents, Kitty and Red, for a summer in Point Place, Wisconsin. And over the weekend, fans got a preview of the cast stepping back into character in their old costumes, Topher and Wilmer, showing off their 70s gear, both writing on Instagram, yep, still fits. No word yet on when exactly that 90s show is set to premiere. And finally, Olivia Rodrigo. Speaking of throwbacks, remember when the Grammy winner went viral for bringing the ultimate 2000s grunge, all the grunge vibes when she was touring. She was doing all those Avril Lavigne covers. Well, now she's kicking it up a notch because over the weekend, Lavigne actually joined Rodrigo on stage for a duet of her 2000s hit, Complicated. Here's a little bit of it. Those are your headlines. We've got a lot more coming your way, including Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical, back on Broadway. And we've got the story behind the beloved story's journey from screen to stage. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. After many starts and stops due, of course, to the pandemic, Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical, is now back on Broadway. It's based, of course, on the 
beloved film starring Robin Williams, and we caught up with one of the film's original stars who told us what it was like to see the movie come to life on stage. Here's our interview with Lisa Jacob, who played Lydia in the film, and Annalise Scarpacci, who is playing Lydia on The Great White Way. So finding out that Mrs. Doubtfire was being made into a musical, I continue to be shocked at the fact that this story keeps resonating for people. And it's just, it's such an honor to know that these, these ideas about, uh, you know, love is what makes a family. These still are continuing. And people that I know who are, you know, my age, who watched this movie growing up are now showing it to their kids. The water's boiling. Hello! Ah! It's just so wonderful to know that this is a story that continues to be um, important and meaningful for people. Oh my gosh. I mean, my dad and I would watch this movie Without fail, any time that it was on, and my dad was the first one to show me the movie, and I, well, when I knew that they were auditioning girls who were 18 and older to play Lydia, I was like, oh my gosh, this is my, ch I love this movie so much, I need to play this role. And I was fortunate enough to audition, and I got the role the next day, they called the next day and they offered me the role, and I was freaking out, and you know, this whole story revolves around the relationship between Lydia and her father. So to have that moment that my dad and I, it, it's like my dad and I's movie, so it meant a lot. It was absolutely incredible to be back in Mrs. Doubtfire after the hiatus. We've been working on this show. I was 19 when I was cast and now I'm 22. We always say that when, you, when you're in a musical um, that you become a family but Mrs. Doubtfire is something that I've never experienced before, especially one because we've gone through something unimaginable, which is the pandemic, plus multiple hiatuses. Last night was our third opening night, and um, that's very rare. <laughs> and I feel like third time's a charm. This is, it's really special, and I'm happy to be doing it with everyone in this family. We are just, we're, we just clicked immediately. Seeing Mrs. Doubtfire on Broadway coming to life. It was absolutely surreal. I have been wanting to see it for such a long time and Annalise and I have become such good friends. We met on Instagram. I am a huge fan of her. And so to be able to finally get to see it, and it was just so much better than I ever could have imagined. So it was a, a truly beautiful evening. Stepping into the role of Lydia is so amazing. It's a lot of pressure. This movie means a lot to a lot of people. What we really found was that they really, really loved it. And we had people coming up to us saying that they loved the movie and that they loved um, what it represented, especially for children of divorce. And we had a lot of adults who were children of divorce and they would come see the show and they were just weeping and thanking us for telling the story. Because it's like Rob McClure says all the time, a lot of movies from that time, it was like the parent trap. The parents would get together in the end. This was the first movie of its time that the parents, it was like, it's okay. It's okay if we, it's better for our family if they aren't together and that's okay. And that really was very radical for that time period. Yeah, it was. We, I think now have moved forward a little bit and, and, and understand this a little bit better, but it really was a, a very conscious decision that was a little bit contentious at times about possibly the parents getting back together at the end. That was something that, you know, the producers had, had talked about. And it was so important to us to say, no, this is real life. It does not always have a happy ending. And what a great opportunity to talk about, even if life doesn't work out the way you expected, you can still be okay. I think it's just such a fantastic reimagining of the story. They have made it modern. They have gone in different directions than we did. And I think this idea of recreating family 
is something that we still need to hear. The idea that a family can be a single mom, a single dad, two dads, two moms, grandmas, aunts, you know, people who aren't even related by blood, that we make family out of love. And I think that that is just such an important concept that just needs to be reinforced over and over again. So this is where I just start crying, right? Uh, you know, Robin, Robin was an incredibly kind, emotional, thoughtful, incredible person. And he wanted to bring joy to people's lives. So I think this would have meant a lot to him. God, that looks like so much fun. And again, you can check out Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical. It is now on Broadway. Coming up next, Glenn Close and her Tehran co-star fill us in on its newest season. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? NBC News, streaming free now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And we're back to Popstar Plus, the incomparable Glenn Close joined the latest season of the action-packed series, Tehran, and she stopped by the third hour along with co-star Neve Sultan to talk about that experience. Hollywood legend Glenn Close and Neve Sultan, they star in the, the season two of the Apple TV Plus series, Tehran. So Neve plays Tamar, a Mossad agent who goes deep undercover for a mission to help destroy Iran's nuclear reactor. And get, uh, Glenn plays a fellow agent tasked with helping Tamar make her way out of the tangled mess of webs. What else do I need to know? Speak. Faraz, when we picked up Milad, he was there waiting for us. You should have told me about this immediately. If I had, you never would have let me stay. We're playing a long game here. Mm. Oh, that's a good scene. Welcome. It a good, yeah, it's good. good morning. It's so nice to have both of you here. Mm. Um, Glenn, let's start with you because, I, I mean, you look at your IMDb page and you've done <laughs> so many different things, but this is a role that you took on and you actually learned to speak Farsi mm. in it. I mean, that must have been a huge undertaking. It was a huge challenge, but I have to say, when I saw the first the first uh, season, and Neve seemed to be absolutely fluent in it. Mm. Um, but that is really one of the fun challenges of doing of doing the show. I wanted to be an American speaking Farsi. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to try to speak it so that a Farsi-speaking person would say, oh, my God. <laughs> it's yeah. natural, yeah. I started season one. And your, your character is 
I mean, tech savvy. Tomorrow's pretty tech savvy. <laughs> I understand that's not something the two of you have in common. <laughs> oh, no. Not at all. <laughs> not a Mossad agent, not a hacker, nothing. Very technophobic and very the most liar. Like, I don't know how to lie. <laughs> that's a good trait. Yeah. That's a good trait. I was just watching the two of you watch that clip. What was it like working together and the chemistry and just the whole, I mean, first of all, the backdrop is, is beautiful, but yet in the middle of such an intense role. Do you know what I mean? What was that like for the two of you? It was pretty, it was intense. And, but it was, this is a, a that was a really fun scene to do. I remember um, that scene. It's very yeah. psychological. Um, where she she is in many ways above me, um, but I am the the local deeply embedded Mossad agent, and so there's this kind of a power play going on, uh, and. I have to say, you made me feel so little in that scene. <laughs> so yeah. little. Like, it's close. Just, yeah, but you yeah. have to speak. Yeah. You had this amazing strength and presence, and I didn't have to do anything, and I think it's beautiful. That's great. Which, yeah. which Neve, how, how does that make you feel? I mean, I don't want to say intimidated, but it's Glenn Close. <laughs> it is. How, do you go, how do you go into it this is. role doing these scenes with her? I mean, it's hard to grasp. It was amazing. I didn't know what to expect. I, I honestly, I thought, I imagined she would just make an appearance, do her close-ups, and poof, disappear. Mm. <laughs> but I was happy to find out you have, there's a reason uh, you get so successful in your career and putting aside, obviously, the fact that she is so talented. She works so hard. You have no That's idea. Beautiful. She works so That's hard. That's beautiful, everybody. And she never disappears after her close-ups. <laughs> never. I love that. Well, listen, I, I just realized, I didn't realize, this year marks the 35th anniversary of Fatal Attraction and one of your most memorable roles, obviously. And there's this reboot on the horizon. We've got a TV series star starring Lizzie Kaplan um, and Joshua Jackson. Uh, what's it like to reflect on that film, especially now that it's about to get new treatment, if you will? Wow. Well, it was one of the most, it was a, one of the seminal films of my career. Uh, I remember before I did Fatal Attraction, people said, oh, could she be sexy? And I kept saying, well, I haven't been asked to be sexy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was very, very intense. Mm. And I loved that character. I loved her. And uh, it's always, it's ironic to me that she's considered a villain. I've never mm. considered her a villain. Mm. I thought she was a woman in, in out of control and in great need of help. Mm. But um, yeah, it was incredible to work with Michael uh, and uh, Adrian Lyne. It, it was, um, again, I could I could talk about it forever because yeah. it was that important to me. Fond memories. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That. It came out before you were even born. Yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> I, I just did the math. <laughs> but I, I, I remember it was. Uh, it's interesting to hear you reflect yeah. on the character being misunderstood. I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, you guys thank so you. much for being here. And uh, the episode episode one and two of Tehran's second season will be streaming on Apple TV Plus starting this Friday, May six. That is the one and only Glenn Close. What a legend. And again, don't forget to check out season two of Tehran. It is streaming on Apple TV Plus on Friday. Still to come, one of our favorites from The Office, Ellie Kemper, on her favorite episodes from that show. Next. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now.
And we're back on Popstar Plus. It's the hilarious Ellie Kemper's birthday today. So happy birthday, Ellie. And to commemorate the occasion, we thought we'd have some fun with our flashback interview with Ellie on what it was like for her to join the show The Office. was a huge fan of The Office before I got a part on it. And I joined at the end of season five. And I remember thinking um, during my audition as Aaron, I was reading with Ed Helms and I thought, you know, this is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me career-wise. So if it ends right now, that'll be fine. Well, no, it wouldn't have been fine because then I wouldn't have gotten a part on The Office. So no, the, the greatest thing of all was then learning that I booked the part and I sort of lost my mind and getting to work on the show the first day was surreal because I had seen all these characters for years in my on my television so I felt like they had been in my home and so I knew all of them and I think it took a minute to realize well they don't a television doesn't work both ways they don't know you so it is surreal to feel like you know people and then to actually arrive on a set and and meet them in person it was it was it was like I won the lottery one, two, three. Yes. Okay. Mm. <laughs> 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 Woo! Woo! <laughs> too many Christmas. <laughs> too many Christmas indeed. Hit her up. Oh, oh yeah. One of my favorite episodes is Secretary's Day. Um, I love that episode because, of course, it's all about Aaron. It was written by Mindy Kaling, who is a genius, and there was so much comedy in that, but also a lot of um, emotional uh, uh, baggage. My favorite part about being a receptionist is that I get to have my own desk. Mm -hmm. My foster home, I never had a desk. So it's like, a, I, I don't mean that I didn't like my foster home. I, I did like it, I just didn't have a desk there. Did you have a favorite age? And it's a lot between Aaron and uh, Michael Scott, which to be in a one-on-one -on -one scene with Steve Carell was just exhilarating. And I remember the day we shot the scene in the restaurant, it was just one of the most fabulous days of my life because I got to spend all this one-on-one -on -one time with him and acting with him, and he was a hero of mine, and still is, and so um, that was one of my, selfishly, one of my favorite episodes. I also love Cafe Disco because it's so silly, and why are they all dancing downstairs? And Michael Scott keeps calling it Expresso, and I love any scene, any episode where I'm called to dance, so that was a lot of fun. Aaron and Andy were such a great couple because they were also a little bit on the outside of things. And so I think they shared that kind of um, uh, worldview. And so putting them together, they were a couple oddballs together. So one of my favorite Andy Aaron scenes is actually, I think the first episode I was in, the first or the second, and it also involves Dwight. Because Aaron, this like rube, joins the office and for some reason, I think just because she's new, Andy and Dwight are sort of dueling for her attention. You finding everything okay? Yeah. yeah. Got some ice. <laughs> nope, this is awkward. <laughs> Oops. Uh oh. Oh. Uh oh. Whoops. <laughs> and I just, I was so thrilled to be there in the first place, but it was really funny to like play the comedy of that, not even love triangle, but just um, these two very strange characters dueling for this little Rube's attention was a lot of fun to play. Aaron. Yes. Yeah. Is there a follow follow up question? Filming the finale was overwhelming because there were so many amazing guest stars and also it was the end of the show and I was a late arrival on the show as I mentioned so I think it was maybe a little mysterious to the rest of the cast why I was so I broke down in tears basically every day and it's like you I've only been here for four years but okay I'm an emotional woman it's so amazing to see people respond to the show still now, especially younger people who were definitely too young when the show was actually on, but now can watch it in reruns. And I think what resonates with people is it's an infinitely relatable experience. It's whether you work, whether you're at school, it's everyone identifies these characters in their own lives. Um, they're sort of portraits of people that they know personally. So there's a heart to the show. So it doesn't just feel like you're watching some kind of, uh, I don't know, a sugary sweet show you're watching something that has a lot of emotional depth to it so I think that's what people respond to and a lot of people if they are talking about the show have mentioned that it's helped them through a tough time through an illness or through a difficult time with a loved one and I, I really I think this because I watched it before being on it it's a healing show and I think it's very powerful and um, I'm glad that I got to be a part of that but I'm glad that a show like that exists in the first place
because they're not, you don't see a lot of shows like that these days. <laughs> And a big happy birthday, Ellie. Hope you're having a great day. That's going to do it for Popstar Plus today. Join us again tomorrow. We're going to be diving into the gripping new show, Anatomy of a Scandal. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Oh, my gosh, that's right. They're here. Oh, everyone who loves Today All Day, we hope you guys had a super weekend. We're so happy that you joined us. This is the first Monday it's in May. Crazy, Wait, right? May is here? Yeah. Uh, yes, you're watching our digital show in case you just stumbled upon it accidentally today in 30. It's packed with everything that you need to see from this morning show. We do it in a mere 30 minutes. Today, we're going to start with some hopeful news when it comes to children and COVID vaccines. The FDA now saying that the first shots for our nation's youngest could arrive as early as next month. Stephanie Goss is going to have everything we need to know. Plus, we are remembering country music icon Naomi Judd. We're going to take a look back at the lives she touched through both her music and her open and honest struggle with mental health. The celebration of her life and her legacy and career is just ahead. And we mentioned this before, the first Monday in May, which means one of the biggest fashion events of the year is tonight. We're talking about the Met Gala. You got your dress ready? You're funny. <laughs> Where's the invitation? You need an invitation before oh, you get Oh, you get it in, right? <laughs> We're going to get you ready with a preview of the hottest ticket in town. I can't wait, so let's get right to it. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is on the front lines with the very latest, including a new sign of hope from that war-torn country. Hi, Aaron. Good morning. Good morning, Hoda. After months of enduring hellish conditions, more than 100 Ukrainian women and children are waking up this morning in comparative safety, hoping that the rest can make it out of the besieged port city of Mariupol alive. This amidst reports that more attempted evacuations are underway. This morning in the devastated port city of Mariupol, a rare glimmer of hope. More than 100 women and children escaping what's been described as a place worse than hell. The bomb shelter inside an old steel plant. For weeks, the city's last Ukrainian stronghold has been relentlessly bombarded by Russian forces, with many civilians and soldiers trapped inside. I was afraid to even walk out and breathe some fresh air, this woman says. I was afraid to stick my nose out. Now free, the look on their faces says it all. Although hundreds of civilians and fighters have been left behind, including Lulia Stupina's 24-year-old husband, a Ukrainian fighter. There's been no mention by the United Nations that this corridor will include Ukrainian fighters. That's why we... Uh, we ask uh, United Nations and Red Cross and believers of all confessions to join us to help them because uh, someone should help them. Meanwhile, in the capital, a major show of support from the U.S. Nice media. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, now the most senior U.S. official to arrive in Kyiv since the war began. Dressed in Ukrainian blue, on Saturday, Pelosi thanked President Zelensky for fighting for freedom and democracy. And so our commitment is to be there for you until the fight is done. In Lviv, a very different kind of surprise visit. UN envoy Angelina Jolie in Ukraine on her own personal mission, meeting some of the war's youngest victims. And in war-torn Bucha, an emotional goodbye. 85-year-old artist Lubov Panchenko survived the shelling of her house and Russian occupation in this once peaceful village. But in the end, the war was too much. After finally making it to a hospital, she died this weekend. In the 1960s, Panchenko was known as a defender of Ukrainian culture and a strong opponent of Soviet censorship. This morning, friends and family say goodbye to one of Ukraine's oldest freedom fighters. This week, the First Lady is expected to make her second solo international trip. Dr. Jill Biden will travel to Romania and Slovakia during the five-day visit. She's expected to meet with U.S. service members as well as Ukrainian refugees. Hoda. Aaron McLaughlin for us there in Ukraine. Aaron, thank you. Well, on the COVID front this morning, as cases continue to rise nationwide, there is some hopeful news for families. The FDA could approve vaccines for the nation's youngest children as soon as next month. NBC Stephanie Gosk is here with the latest on this one. Steph, good morning. Good morning, Craig. So far, five and under have not been eligible for the vaccine, and that's been tough for families all across the country. But now, in just weeks, that could all change. 
This morning, hopeful news on the COVID vaccine front for young children. The FDA announcing plans to review Moderna and Pfizer emergency use authorization for kids as young as six months, up through age five. If approved, that would make nearly 20 million children in the U.S. eligible for the vaccine. We'll really be able to afford some solid protection that will give some parents confidence about getting back out. Many parents eager for their children's chance to get the shot. We've been waiting the longest out of everybody um, for vaccines, for protection. This comes at a time when COVID continues to spread. Cases now rising nationwide in all but three states. And while most are mild, hospitalizations are also increasing after hitting their lowest point since March 2020 earlier this month. Former White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Dr. Deborah Burks giving this warning. We should be preparing right now for a potential surge in the summer across the southern United States because we saw it in 2020 and we saw it in 2021. At Saturday's White House Correspondents Dinner, host Trevor Noah joking about the event. You guys spent the last two years telling everyone the importance of wearing masks and avoiding large indoor gatherings. Then the second someone offers you a free dinner, you all turn into Joe Rogan. The packed event just weeks after more than 70 people tested positive after attending the gridiron dinner in the nation's capital. What are we doing? Like, did none of you learn anything from the gridiron dinner? Nothing. Can this still end diplomatically with Vladimir Putin in charge of Russia? Our promise to take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Is that enough? The circus-like stuff that the hearings turned into. This system seems broken. What do we do? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Lots more to get to on this Monday morning, including that stunning news over the weekend on the death of a country music icon, Naomi Judd. Yeah, her daughters, Winona and Ashley, announced her passing on Saturday and are now leading the emotional tributes, including last night's Country Music Hall of Fame ceremony. NBC's Kathy Parks in Nashville for us. Hey, Kathy, good morning. Hoda, good morning to you. The Judds arrived here in Music City in 1979 and eventually would become a part of the fabric of country music. Last night, they were inducted to the Country Music Hall of Fame. And at one point, a very emotional Winona Judd called the moment a blessing, but said she was also broken with the passing of her mother. This morning, grief and heartbreak over the loss of country music icon Naomi Judd. Fans mourning her death outside Sunday night's Country Music Hall of Fame ceremony, where Naomi and her daughter Winona were inducted as a Grammy winning duo, the Judds. Ashley and Winona Judd overcome with emotion, remembering their beloved mother. My mama loved you so much, and she appreciated your love for her. And I'm sorry that she couldn't hang on until today. At 2.20, I kissed her on the forehead and I walked away. The last thing we did together as a family with her was we all gathered around her and we said, the Lord is my shepherd. Music superstar Carrie Underwood paying tribute to Naomi at Stagecoach over the weekend. The Grand Ole Opry held a moment of silence for her Saturday, just hours after Winona and her sister Ashley Judd announced her mother's death on social media, writing, Today, we sisters experienced a tragedy. We lost our beautiful mother to the disease of mental illness. We are shattered.
While no cause of death was given, Naomi had openly discussed her struggles with depression for many years, speaking to Savannah in 2017. You talk in the book about thinking about wanting to commit suicide. Yeah, that's how bad it can get. You get down in this, it's so hard to describe because you get down to this deep, dark hole of depression. I want to let the world know that it's not a character flaw, it's a disease. Born in Ashland, Kentucky, Naomi moved to California with her family. After her marriage ended, she raised her daughters as a single parent and became a nurse. She launched her music career with Winona in the 80s, eventually scoring 14 number one country hits like Grandpa Tell Me About the Good Old Days and Mama He's Crazy. The Judds took a break from performing in 1991 after Naomi was diagnosed with hepatitis C. Naomi also spoke to Hoda and Kathy Lee about parenthood in 2013 as she was playing a mom in a movie. Mm -hmm. You know, this lady's a helicopter mom. Mm -hmm. uh, she's really a smother. Um, <laughs> and in real life, I have That's finally good. learned what to be like a fireman sorry, with Ryan mom. Ashley. I just come That's when safe. I'm called. The Judds had planned to reunite for a farewell tour this fall. Last month, they returned to the stage at the CMT Music Awards, singing their Grammy Award winning hit. Love can build Dazzling crowds once again. And Naomi's final performance. Don't you think it's time? Naomi Judd was 76 years old. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Yeah, well, our hearts are ready for something like this. Come on. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything you need. Look who's back together. Oh, I'm so you know, happy. I that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> season two. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. If it's Monday, it's Motivational Monday, and we have an expert on the subject today. Since 2019, today, today, oh, your name has has been helping people cycle toward their fitness goals as one of the premier Peloton instructors. Mm. Now she's sharing her personal journey to help inspire others to find their purpose with her first book. Mm -hmm. It's called Speak, Find Your Voice, Trust Your Gut, and Get From Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. And Tunde is here with us to talk about it. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. You have a fan in pretty much everyone in the building. I remember when Al Roker was talking about you eons oh, yes. ago. We call him Uncle Al at Peloton. Uncle, Uncle Al. Uncle Al, because he's always Al. in the classes. We love it. So here's the thing. You know, when you're on that bike, people would see you, and they just assumed you've always been that way. You've always been that confident. But that's not necessarily the case. Right. And I think it builds to your journey and is inspiring for people to know it wasn't that long ago that you didn't feel that way. Yeah, I was overweight. I had low self-esteem, low confidence. I was supposed to be a bridesmaid in one of my aunt's weddings. I when was this? Like this was, I mean, this was years ago. I Wait, was which probably, one? Hold on, let me see. in high school. That's me in front. That was my mother behind. Okay. Um, and I was supposed to be a bridesmaid 
in my aunt's wedding, I couldn't fit the bridesmaid dress, so my mother had to sew two dresses together wow. so that I could wear the same dress as everyone. That was my, like, rock bottom turning point. My mom said, if you want change, you have to make a change. Wow. Wow. And so I started working out started eating healthy. I was a makeup artist for 15 mm -hmm. years, loved my job until I hated it, mm -hmm. woke up one day, hated it, and decided that, again, if I wanted to change things up, I had to change things up, and then so, I found fitness. So you did have this successful career, but you're in New York, you take a cycling class, because why not, right. and then you had a blue light moment. Right. What, what made you click in that moment? Well, I, I, it was my first cycling class ever. Kelly Ripa was talking about in, in home or in cycle studios, you clip into the bike, so I had to try it. I left that 45 minute class and I was floating and I had what I call a blue light moment. Mm -hmm. It almost felt like a divine download. Mm -hmm. After my first cycling class, I knew that I'd be teaching it. I knew that I'd be teaching it on the very biggest platform without even knowing what Peloton was. Wow. And so I could have dismissed that as just daydreaming, hallucination, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I took it as this opportunity. I think that the beauty of uncertainty is infinite possibility. Mm -hmm. And I took the chance. And, and a lot of folks probably don't realize. I mean, I, you're one of my favorite instructors. I mean, I'm like. I paid you $20 to say that on TV. Ah. Thank you. And it's funny because I, you know, I've never seen you off the bike. But when you're on, when she's on the bike, like, she, it, she's like a monster. Like, sometimes. <laughs> Oh they let up. You know, I've worked a full day. You know, I can't waste your time. But but in 2016, your first audition, you you failed, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it took trying again. How can folks who are watching or listening? How can they find their own blue light moment? Mm. I mean, I think it's a, a matter of trusting that internal pulse. I think it's intuition. I think we all have it. We just learn to suppress it. At a very young age, you say, "This is what I want to be, and this is what I want to do," and then people tell you to get realistic, grow up. Um, for me, it was coming back to that pulse. I call it in the book. I speak to it as the drumbeat, mm. and so I follow the guide of the drumbeat. It's my internal compass. I love that. I was reading the book. I didn't realize this. You talk about, you know, it can be hard to push when it adversity pops up after experiencing not only the loss of your brother, but then your parents. Right. What do you tell yourself and what did you tell yourself to remain motivated? There are a lot of people who are dealing with grief. Yeah. I lost my brother when he was 19 years old. Three years after that, I lost my dad. And then three years after that, I lost my mother. So mm. I lost half of my immediate family within six years. Mm. Uh, I always say we don't get to choose what happens, but we do get to choose how we react. Yeah. Today's a new day. I choose to be new in it. I live because they cannot. And mm. today's a new day, so I choose to be new in it. Wow. I've heard you actually say that on the bike, yeah. what you just said. Yeah. About not being able to choose what happens, but how you respond to it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And what is your advice for people who, you know, they set a goal for themselves and they want it immediately? You know, like they're doing everything to kind of get this instant gratification, but it takes a little bit longer right. than immediate. Progress, not perfection. Give yourself attainable goals as it relates to fitness or anything uh, other. Give yourself attainable goals. Uh, I think when you know when people start out on their wellness journey, they have mm -hmm. X goal and they want to achieve this and they want it in two weeks. Right. Give yourself bite-sized chews because you need wins to continue. So start small, feel that win. That win will motivate you for the next one. Well, also, what I love about so Tunde on the bike yes. is she actually does like the whole, like she does the session like with Like motivating? Some of the I'm other, sweating. Some of, oh, some of the other instructors, funny. I'm like, you know what, maybe a little less talk and a little more, <laughs> a little more you well, I mean, you and, yeah, Look, I happen to sweat a lot. I, I, just, I think it's my pore size or whatnot. <laughs> also, we've got some Beyonce fans in the yes. room. I don't use the Beyonce fan because I want the sweat dripping it out of yeah. me. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I sweat a lot. It's so nice to have you. <laughs> well, Tunde, thank yeah. you so much again. It's thank when you. somebody is so you know, confident. It's great to know your journey. It's Thank like you. we can too. Speak is out tomorrow and you can also catch her tour with some special guests called Speak a Soul Care event. Love Good love stuff. This. Congratulations. Right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. If I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right now. We are meeting people one after the next 
who've made profound changes. It's the little moments that are the transforming moments. Oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Oh my gosh, I could apply that. I want to stop for a second. <laughs> In season two, I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. We're back. It's Tuesday. Justin Sylvester in for Jenna. Okay, the Met Gala is huge, man. Right. And when you can get a little scoop on that, usually it's like airtight, but what do we know? Okay, you guys. So, first things first. Yeah. It's the first Monday of May. <laughs> yeah. Put your sweatpants on. Yeah. Pop that popcorn. <laughs> The themes are always a little weird. Okay. You know, it's like the Da Vinci Code. You <laughs> gotta be able to break the theme down. Okay. You gotta crack it. So what is it? What is well, it? Well, the theme is in America, an anthology of fashion. Okay. But I've done my research, I've talked to a few people. Yeah. What they want you to do is embody gilded glamour. Gilded glamour. So what is that what is that even? You mean? know, like the foxtails and the petticoats oh. and all of these oh. things. Think you're going to Gloria Vanderbilt's house for dinner <laughs> on a Sunday, <laughs> is how I put it. And I'm going to love it. I think it's going to be a good one So wait, today. are people going to do top hats and the whole Megillah? I think people are going to go off. Okay. okay. All right. Now, um, we were wondering, by the way, you said you said at Laura Vanderbilt's house. You haven't been to Anderson Cooper's house. I've been there for, a, 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 I crashed a Christmas party or two. Okay, good. <laughs> you have quite the social life. He rolls in here and I'm like, so how was your weekend? And you rattled off. I mean, uh, where were you? I got to do it. I had dinner with Kelly Ripa. We have Sunday dinner when I'm in town. She's the best. I love her. Can I come to dinner at your house? I was going to say, yeah, she's on the other channel, and I love Kelly, too. But <laughs> next time you come to ours. Okay, so a lot of people use the Met Gala as, like, a moment where they're going to say, we've arrived. Yes, yes. Is, is that going to be happening? Well, you remember, like, oh. Justin Timberlake and Jessica Biel did it. A-Rod and J-Lo. You remember that moment? What? ASAP Rock and Rihanna did it last year. A lot of people are wondering if Kim and Pete are going to do it, I have a feeling she will not do it this year. Why? I think she's tried her hardest to make a name in fashion for herself. And I think she wants to go alone. She likes to sit and talk to everybody. Oh, so if you're with a couple, you can't. You socialize. can't do that. But the one couple yeah. that I'm kind of upset oh, about, oh, oh. I think we were gonna get that Harry Styles oh. and Olivia Wilde moment. Oh, but because but because of what happened last week. Which was the girls were getting messy, y'all. Jason Sudeikis <laughs> served her with those custody papers live on stage and said that he didn't know that, you know, where it was gonna happen. I don't sure, think Jan. He, no, I sure, don't, Jan. I don't think he knew. I think he, he knew. You know what? Maybe he thought it was gonna be outside. You think he knew? Okay, I don't know. I okay, 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 I'll give you that. But so you don't think they're gonna make their moment as a couple no. because it would be too much stuff and too many questions. Too about many the questions. Papers. I wouldn't do. Okay, it. now what's everyone gonna be wearing? Is there like one hot designer or what happens? Well, this is what I love about the Met Gala. What? Anna Wintour keeps that stuff top oh, secret. She does. Only the person wearing it, the designer, and her team know exactly what's gonna go down that carpet. But I know a few people, okay, so. and I heard that Megan the Stallion's gonna wear Moschino this year. Okay. And that's like kind of rap royalty. That's what they do. Nicki okay. Minaj, Cardi B, okay. they've all worn Jeremy Scott. Okay. And of course, Kim Kardashian, Balenciaga. She's the face of Balenciaga. She's been wearing it she morning, goes, noon, and night. Right? Yeah, yeah, she's wearing that stuff in her sleep. <laughs> okay. So okay. she is definitely gonna wear it. Yeah. And now all the Kardashians are invited for the first time this year. Wait, so usually just Kim? It's usually Kim, Kylie, and Kendall. Courtney and Chloe, sorry y'all. <laughs> y'all not getting that invite, but what, this what year they Chris? got it. Chris always goes with Tommy Hilfiger. Goes. Yeah, oh, Tommy Hilfiger. Okay, and what about Katy Perry? Is someone gonna wear like wacky? Well, I don't know if Katy Perry's gonna do it. She said that she's going, she's playing a whole different card this year and flipping it because she always goes all out. I cannot wait. It's that, gonna be good. It's so good. Are you here tomorrow? By the way, hold on, hold on. Are you here tomorrow? Aren't you going to the Met Gala? No, I'm not going to the Met Gala. Have you never I've been? I've never, ever been. If someone does not invite <laughs> this national treasure to the Met Gala, and by the way, if you ever go to the Met Gala. You're my plus one? I'm your plus one, and I want to see that hair down to the ankle. Like, I want like a 90-inch weave. Don't y'all want to see her all glammed out? So right? Crazy. You guys want to see that, right? <laughs> Over the past four decades, Judith Light has starred in more than 70 TV series and movies and scoring multiple Emmys, a couple of Tonys, of course, along uh -huh. the way. Now, Judith stars in Julia, an HBO Max original, which takes us behind the scenes of Julia Child's success. And Judith plays Julia's publisher. Check it out. There's no denying it. TV is the future. TV is not the future. 
It's fleeting. Airwaves carry no weight. They have no heft, no book in your hands. Books accumulate in the minds of the readers who invest in them. Gosh, I like that. Well, books are a legacy. A legacy to be proud of. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad your show is helping to get your name out there. But we want that next book. That's what's important. That's what counts. No. Oh my God, you totally believe everything. <laughs> I mean, what counts, what counts is what? the fact that I'm sitting in between two gay icons right now. <laughs> the fact that security- In your glitter sweater, in my I glitter might sweater, add. Right? 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 What the does fact. it mean to be sitting next to Judith Light? Judith Light, you <laughs> are the goat, okay? Oh, you, so what you did in Transparent, what you did in The Politician. <laughs> I remember the movie where you um, defended your ex-husband when he was up for murder on you Lifetime. You are not old oh, enough to remember that. Thank you, Lifetime, for rewinding those things for me, but your career is so amazing. Mm -hmm. How has it been being in Hollywood and keeping that career alive yeah. when you see that women, you know, when they get to a certain age, yeah. Hollywood kind of cuts them off? Yeah, well, you have to really pay attention. And, and you have to, we have to do what we all women, mm -hmm. all of us have to do, which is to really stand up mm -hmm. and to say, we're not over. Ye attention must be paid, which is a, a great line from Death of a Salesman, which is, it, it's like you really have to say, we are here and there are stories about us that people actually want to see. How do you do that, given that, I mean, Justin makes a great point, we know this, in Hollywood, people, you know, people make up their minds. Yeah. They're like, thank you for your protest, but this is the way we're going. It's not, it's, it, it's not just Hollywood. Yeah. It's in our culture. It's yeah. baked into our culture. And the more that women stand up, and you see a yeah. lot of us that are around the same age, we mm -hmm. are standing up. You had Glenn yeah. Close on the yeah. show mm -hmm. today. I mean, you, you see, you, Meryl Streep, yeah. Alison Janney, yes. I mean, all of these extraordinary um, artists, mm -hmm. and they're saying, we're here and give us the work. Give us the work. Yeah. Give us the work yeah. and give us the stories because the people, and it is our fans, it is the people who watch us, they're the ones who want to see those stories. And so that's what you have to get. And you have to keep saying it over and over again until it becomes something that becomes more natural to the culture. It was the same thing yeah, with the gay well, community. You're right. You know, you know, you had to keep saying the same things over and over again until people got it. And well, that's you what you have to funny. do. You talk about Julia Child, by the way, and if that's you look right. at her life, too, there was a point where she was cast aside, too. They said to her later in her career, thank you very much. We're kind of sending you out to, you know, to go on your way. Well, they also <clears throat> said to her, you're not pretty enough. Yeah. You're a big boned woman. Yeah. You're not you're not the picture of what everybody wants. You're not the right stuff. And when other people say that to you and you like Julia said, I am me. Julia Child wasn't teaching cooking. Julia Child was teaching authenticity. Yes. Oh my God, That's yes. she was teaching you how to listen to your intuition and be the person, the authentic person that you are. And I've always said that about the gay community. It's yeah. the same thing. It's the LGBTQIA plus community that says we're we're here and this is our life and this is who we are. That was Julia Child. And I think when the 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 beauty of what HBO Max is doing and this extraordinary show with these amazing actors and my good friend Chris Kaiser and Daniel Goldfarb and um, you David Hyde Pierce and you watch the story you watch the story of a marriage you watch the story of someone who drops the chicken on the floor and says 30 second rule nobody will know I wouldn't even attempt to imitate her in any way shape or form but it's like you know you've got Fiona Glasscott and, and B.B. Newworth and, and Sarah Lancashire you've got these really um, these artists that really care about the work. Mm. And people are responding. I mean, yeah. the, the fact that, that, that people are responding to Julia is, uh, is, is mm -hmm. really... Decades people later. love it. Decades later. She's the one that started the whole cooking uh, show mm -hmm. dynamic. You see yeah. the Food Network now, and it's like, she, she was the, started it. She did. She paid for it. She put her money where her mouth was. Wow. She was it's, the OG Paris Hilton. She was. To cooking. You know, <laughs> Paris Hilton started reality TV. And She's Julia Roberts. Yeah. 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 She was kind of. We're just kind of, <laughs> kind of, not, no shade, yeah. not, not at all. I mean, oh God. God, you know, bless Judith her. Judith Light said no shade. <laughs> Judith Light said no shade on the Today Show is, next to Hoda. I'm done. I'm is done. that, is that 
That's cool. Is that okay? That's, 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 that's cool. super cool. Okay. You can catch, by the way, Julia streaming on HBO Max right now. <laughs> you can. Thank you, Julia. So happy to we see love you both. <laughs> Before we go, we have a new Read with Jenna book to share with you. It is called Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. For more on the book and to join Jenna's Club and to join the conversation as well, you can scan that QR code. It's right at the bottom of your screen right now. Scan the code. Have a great Monday, folks. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Tuesday? To oh, we can't ever do that. Amen. No, it's so good. Oh, it smells like pastry. What are you doing? Um, can we not put your face in the dough? I'm glad it's just us eating it. Hi everybody and welcome to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. I can't wait to take a look back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal segments and offer just a few of those tips and tricks that didn't quite make it into the original episode. In today's episode, we are all about apples. Everyone in my family loves apples, and I use them in so many different recipes in so many different ways. Just ask Ollie. I love taking the boys apple picking. I don't know why, it ends up being one of the most stressful days. Um, you know, somebody has to go to the bathroom, somebody's hungry. Uh, there's no parking because the <laughs> apple orchards are so crowded outside of New York City, but I am determined to always take the boys apple picking. I just think it's fun. Once you kind of go along that row and there's nobody else around for a little while and you pick the best apples, you kind of sneak a bite here and there. And the best part is I make so many different things with apples that I love bringing a big bushel of apples home and just seeing what we can do with them. For anyone else who went apple picking recently, here are two easy ways to use up all those apples. First up, my crunchy apple salad. Cal has a list of the ingredients you'll need for this recipe. So let's go through the ingredients, okay? What's in our apple salad? Apple. And zucchini. <laughs> Try again, not zucchini. Salad? So close. Celery. Celery. <laughs> and what are these? I think you know. Cranberry. You've been snacking on those since we started. Do you know what this is? A nut. It's a walnut. Walnut. And then you know this one. Yogurt. Lots of vanilla yogurt. So this apple salad is a perfect after school snack. It's a good breakfast. It's just a good all around nice healthy alternative. How's the yogurt doing? Do you want a spoon? Gross. You want to help me with the apple? Let me, let me cut it up into a smaller piece for you. You are actually eating all of my ingredients. No, not that many. Chop it up nice and small. You're doing a lot more eating than cooking. What's your favorite fruit? Apple. Celery, it's really hard. While you do that, I'm going to chop up the celery. Okay. I like to make the celery really small. Why? so that it's not too hard to chew. Hmm. So Kevin, when I was little, yeah. I used to eat this all the time, every single morning for breakfast. Was that a long time ago? It was a long time ago. Even when I first moved to New York, I used to eat it all the time, every morning for breakfast. Ew, eat that here. Mix it up. Yep, mix it all together. All right, what should we put in next? How about some of these? Yeah, of course. Sprinkle those all in there? I can pour it. Okay. Perfect. And now let's chop these up a little smaller. Just rock your knife back and forth. <laughs> Look at how small I made these. Whoa. So now we got all our ingredients in here, right? And here's the fun part. There you go. And this is the medium one or the biggest one? What, bowl or a spoon? Spoon. That's the small one. I have to lick it off. <laughs> Did you have to lick it off? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, to get the yogurt on it. <laughs> so you can add as much yogurt as you want. It's not really a measurement here. It's more just once everything is all nice and combined. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll add blueberries in here. Oh, I have to lick it off. Oh. I just eat it off. 
so that's it. Super simple, right? I usually make a big bowl of this and then just scoop it out in the morning or you can divvy it up into little Tupperware containers and it's good to go as a grab and go snack. Are we done? That's it, that's all we have to do. Are you gonna taste one? I'm gonna taste one too. A taste test? It's a taste test. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, what spoon should I use? Mm. Mm. Is it healthy? It's very healthy. Up next, we are taking apples from sweet to sweeter with one of my favorite fall treats, apple dumplings with a homemade caramel sauce. You don't want to miss this. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Look who's back together. Oh, I'm so, so happy. happy. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To stand on the edge of the cliff and jump takes a lot of guts. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda for new episodes of her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. 
Welcome back to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal. Today's episode is all about using a favorite fall staple, apples. Next up, Cal and I are making apple dumplings with a homemade caramel sauce. This recipe takes a bit more time, a bit more patience, but I promise it's worth it. I first saw this recipe in Better Homes and Gardens' new cookbook. So here's how to make one of my favorite fall treats. There are a lot of steps, but it's still pretty easy, okay? There's only three things. We need the caramel sauce that goes on top, We've got the apples that we're going to fill with this little filling, and we're gonna wrap it in pastry dough. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this is a hot apple. That's a nice apple. You said the water? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't eat everything. Pour in the sugar. Mom? Yes. Yeah. And I'm just gonna do half this cinnamon, not all of it. So I'm gonna bring this up to a boil, and this is gonna be our caramel sauce. We still have some things to do. You ready to make the filling? All right, what do you think those are? Mm -hmm. Walnuts. Walnuts. And what are those? Raisins. Raisins. And we're gonna add honey. A tablespoon of honey. This is gonna be our filling for the apples. Dump the salt into the flour. All the salt? Yeah. Do you know what this is? Mm -mm. What do you think it is? I don't know. This is called a shortening. You wanna make the shortening look like little bits of peas in here. What happens if we eat it? It would taste disgusting. Press it down and twist. There you go. Press and twist. Press it hard. All right, now we're gonna add the half and half. Now can I pour it? What are we making? Apple dumplings, remember? Oh, yummy? Yeah. Is it dessert? It is a dessert. When it's done, can I eat one of it? Of course. And you? Yes. Smell it smells so good. Oh, it smells like pastry. What are you doing? Um, can we not put your face in the dough? I'm glad it's just us eating it. All right, here we go with our dough. Oh no, we make the hole. No, oh. don't make a hole! Why? Because no more holes, no holes. I need you to start here. Mm -hmm. And end all the way over here. Nice! You put the apple here. I'm gonna fill it. Can you take a little bit of this? This is our standard hiding, hiding spot. A little cinnamon sugar. I'm gonna pour the sauce over the dumplings. Carefully. Mm. You love it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you wanna make this apple dumpling recipe right away, you might be thinking I don't have an apple core like I used, um, but there is a way you can just cut right through the apple. It's, it's tedious, I'll tell you that. In fact, I held off making this recipe until I ordered one of these. <laughs> um, wherever you get you know, kitchen supplies, it's an easy order. Just wait a couple days until it gets there. But if you don't have patience, um, just be careful. And I wouldn't recommend doing this part with the kids because you need a very sharp knife and you literally just have to cut around the core of the apple. So make sure you go all the way to the bottom. This is probably the worst part of the whole recipe, is coring the apple. Just wanna make sure we get to the other side. My kids eat a lot of apples, and whether I'm slicing them or dicing them or doing whatever it is with apples, there's just no good way to get the seeds out. But this, this works pretty well. Okay, 
So you can either do it that way if you don't have patience, although I think this way is the way to go. So this is what an apple core does. Basically the same thing the knife did, just in all one big swoop. And get it in there. Twist it, pull it up. And there you go. That was easier, right? So I'd recommend just holding off a couple days on this recipe and wait till you get your apple core. I mean, because that's perfect. So to core the apple with a knife, you wanna make sure you use a paring knife. They're nice and sharp, they're tiny. If you use anything bigger, I feel like you're gonna cut the whole apple up. Um, and a steak knife would just never work for this. So get yourself a paring knife too. <laughs> for all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. I'll do the chocolate chips. No, I want to. No. Fine. Yay. Let's, do the let's pour it at the same time, Alexander. Three, Three two, two, one. Whee! My name's Alexander Charbonnet, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. My name is Alexander Charbonnet. I'm seven years old, and I'm in second grade. I started cooking when I was five for my mom and my dad and my sister. I started my cooking channel two years ago when I was five. Hi guys, hi friends, welcome to my show. Kids can cook with Chef Alexander. We are making banana muffins with no egg, cause I'm allergic to egg. My egg allergy um, makes me sad, but I'm more sad because I can't eat stuff like other people. Because of my allergy, I can't eat cookies or donuts or like cakes or like a lot of stuff. My mom is awesome because she makes eggless stuff like cookies, cupcakes, and regular cakes. But my mom and I bring um, treats like cookies without egg to school with me so I can enjoy it with my friends. My little sister has a peanut allergy. She can have like peanut butter and jelly. So I feel like she's a special too. My mom was the one who taught me how to cook. Um, my favorite part of cooking is I get to spend special time with my mom cooking. My favorite hobbies are playing video games, um, riding my bike, riding my scooter. Um, I also really love dinosaurs. Here's some, a, a fact of some dinosaurs. Did you know that the Allosaurus does, doesn't have serrated teeth? And it actually uses jaw. He, he opens his mouth and he slashes his upper jaw into its prey like a hammer. We are making donut chocolate donut cakes. So we have this flour, so we're gonna dump it into the sieve. <laughs> I wanna be a pastry chef because I'm already a pastry chef. I am so excited because today we are making eggless trini macaroni and pie and blender muffins with apples, bananas, and carrots. First we're gonna start with the macaroni pie. Here's everything we need to start with. We got butter, we got olive oil, cut up onions, onion powder, garlic powder, black pepper, flour, mustard, cheese, salt, but we also need elbow and pasta and milk. First we're gonna make the cheese sauce. First we're gonna melt the, the butter the, and the olive oil over medium heat. Now the next step we need to add the onions. Make sure you cook it for a few minutes because we don't want the smell of the onions to make us cry. The next step, you need to add the flour and you need to make a roux. A roux is fat mixed with flour. You need to um, whisk it so it doesn't give that raw flour taste. That would taste horrible. This is what's gonna thicken the sauce since I'm not using egg. Now we need 
to add the milk to the pot, but make sure to add it slowly because we don't want it to spot all over the place. Now we need to whisk it until it's fully incorporated. Next, we're going to add the mustard. Now we're ready to put in the spices. We got our onion powder, the garlic powder in, and the black pepper in. And the salt, let's put in the salt too. Bubbling, it looks like lava. This is what we're looking for. I wish you guys can smell this. Because that really smells good. Now for the best part, we put in the cheese. Now we're going back to mixing. The sauce looks like this. This is a little hot, so you know who I need? Mommy! Almost there, up. It's important to incorporate the pasta into the cheese sauce. We're gonna put in a greased baking dish and then we're gonna top it off with cheese. This looks great. Now we're just gonna add some cheese to on the top. I need to pop this in the oven, so I need to call mom again. Mom! Oh, it looks good. Okay, I'm gonna open the oven for you. Okay. Thanks, mom. Oh no, thank you. Good job. We're gonna let it bake for 25 or 30 minutes. This looks awesome. It wouldn't be complete without my favorite person. Mmm. Mm. Yeah. We come from a long line of foodies in our family, a long line of cooks, and you're just carrying on that tradition by continuing to be one of the chefs in our family. <laughs> the Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now we're gonna make one of my favorite recipes, blender muffins without egg. They have apples, carrots, and bananas. But to help me, I'm gonna have my sister, Natalie. Come on. Boing. So, we're gonna make, introduce yourself, Nellie. 
Okay, so my name is Natalie, and I'm going in kindergarten soon. And my, my favorite food is fruits and vegetables. Five, I'm five. And I'm Alexander's sister. And my nickname and, is Peanut. And her nickname is Peanut, but she has a peanut allergy. But this also has um, no eggs, so it's Isn't that simple. funny, guys? Now we have this big mixing bowl. So now we're gonna put, it, put in all our dry ingredients. Let's start with the flour. Put in the brown sugar. Up, oh, flop. Oh, there's still some. Ah, oh, there you go. To put it back. Now we need to put in the white sugar. Now, now we put in baking powder. Soda and my now turn. Let's put in baking soda. Now let's put in some soda. cinnamon, like for cinnamon rolls. Let's mix, let's make Finger Muffins mix, 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 mix up. <laughs> Agitate around. Okay, okay. Your turn. Now we need the blender, and now we're gonna ask Mom for the blender. Mom! So now we're gonna add the the apples, the carrots, and bananas to the blender. Let's start with the apples. Yeah. Plop, plop. It's time for carrot time. We're gonna put in the carrots. And guys, in case you know, these are for our bunnies, but we use them for baking now. Let's put the banana peel in. Break it in half, and then put the other half in. That might be smart. <laughs> it looks it's weird. Blender. I'm trying to get the ones in the on the back. Maybe we should do it together. Let's mix and agitate, agitate, agitate. Let's mix and agitate. Let's do that. Mm -mm -mm. Now let's add. I'll add the Put butter. Vanilla and let's do it. Three, two, one. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'll do the chocolate chips. No, I want to. No. Fine. Yay. Let's, let's pour it at the same time, Anza. Three, two, one. Whee! I'll do the oats. Wait, the oats. Oh, this looks good. Now we have our muffin tin. Yep. We get to spray our muffin tin. Yeah, we need to do it three quarter way full. How about you scoop it and I put it in? Ready to go in the oven now. And now let's get mom. Now it's going to take 18 to 22 minutes. Bye, we'll see you on the next day. I just want to gobble them all up and then out. These have been cooling for 10 minutes, so they're ready to eat. Merk,
makes the yummy dream.